Part Four, Chapter One of Canada's One Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Canada's One Hundred Days by John Livesay, Part Four, Chapter One. Battle Pieces, on September Twenty Eighth. Canadian Corps headquarters moved from Nouvelle Vitasse into what had been an enemy headquarters situated in the heart of the Drucourt Caen line, half a mile east of Caen. The new camp is on rising ground and remains fairly dry even in wet weather, a pleasant change from our previous quarters. The enemy had here constructed elaborate dugouts thirty feet below the surface with commodious canvas-lined rooms, but for the most part the staff works and sleeps in tents grouped in and about a little wood, the whole camouflaged against air observation. The enemy persistently shells our railhead at Caen with a long-distance gun, whose shell at stated intervals goes whining over the camp. Trainloads of prisoners standing overnight in the yards, waiting to be moved to the base, protest at our inhumanity. Little damage is done, though one shell lands in the lines of the Corps garage. Several Canadian ambulances are located at Caen, but escape injury. There joins a Canadian Corps about this time, a young staff officer lent by the British Army, who at once makes himself very popular. This is His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Some of us had apprehensions of an atmosphere of swank and embarrassment but these are speedily set at rest. He lives, like any other staff officer, in an Armstrong hut, and soon he is a familiar figure, chatting freely with both officers and men, and it is not long before GSO number 2 is regarded as a distinct acquisition to Corps. He brings with him a charm and vivacity of manner. One thought of his grandfather, King Edward, that sets us all at our ease, an unstudied courtesy and friendly interest that breaks down the most crusted reserve, with a keenness for his work that at times must be a source of anxiety to those responsible for his well-being, for he is never so happy as when rotting around the front line, and has a way of slipping off by himself and paying unexpected visits to battalion and company headquarters. It is after one of these, when his host was clearly overcome by the honor unexpectedly thrust upon him, that he remarks, He couldn't have been afraid of me. It must have been the name. So, through several weeks, he weaves his unconscious charm, and when he comes to leave us, it is with reluctance on his part and regret on ours. For not even the sternest Democrat among us, whether officer or man in the ranks, can long resist a winning personality whose frankness disarms, while his natural, unassuming bearing wins confidence and even affection. It is a valuable experience on both sides. Citizens of a democratic country like Canada are accustomed to the aloof detachment and cultivated superiority of their great ones, in a word, to the snobbishness of wealth and power. And it is a delightful contrast to find in the heir to the throne a fine simplicity and the easy assumption of equality among soldiers and friends. This impression is so genuine, so spontaneous, that one hears his praises on every hand. Gentlemen, the Prince of Wales will dine with us tomorrow night, and I want you all to be in your places. This injunction of the mess president was not needed, and that evening will always be remembered by members of the friendly sea mess as a most delightful experience. Most of us might be described by the ungenerous as old fogies, but that night we refurbished our youth and gave the prince a good old-fashioned Canadian welcome. It is at Caen that news comes to the Canadian Corps of the Armistice proposals. Enemy accepts unconditionally Wilson's terms, agrees to evacuate, and asks for an immediate armistice. I don't think we'll listen to that for a while. Everything is going fine, and the spirit of our men is splendid, comments an officer of the 5th CMR, first to enter Cambrai, where the news reached him. We must have an unconditional surrender, or in two months' time he will be ready to start at us again. And one of his men adds, We lads have been at it a long time. 
but we want to see it through even if we stay six months or a year. It is interesting to collect these views while the news is yet hot. He knows he's beaten. We'll have our own peace this winter, says a private from the Ottawa Valley, a Tommy from West Riding. When Jerry comes knocking at the door with his pride in his pocket, he must be in a pretty bad way. A cook of the 87th Battalion. We've got him going and must keep pushing him along. If he had us where we had him, he wouldn't listen to soft soap peace offers. It's the Rhine for us. When we get there next year, he'll knuckle down. Another man of the same battalion, Grenadier Guards of Montreal, they'll know how to deal with him. Bullets are the only peace argument the Boche can understand. A sergeant who was reputed to have charged a machine gun nest at Blecourt with his bare fists. The Hun is bankrupt. We must make him liquidate to the last cent of his assets. Our widows and orphans demand it. That can be done only by the sword. The captain of an imperial heavy battery, working his guns from the slope of Bourlon Wood, is of the same opinion. I don't like it, he says. The enemy is short of men and material. He is crippled for lack of field guns, and his ammunition seems running low. He'll drag on peace negotiations for three months, and then go at us again. Indeed, this news excites more apprehension than hope. For the Canadian soldier, the cherished approach to Bourlon Wood must ever be from Ichny en artois over the Canal du Nord, and then up winding slopes past Quarry Wood, crossing the Marquion Line, and so through Bourlon Town. This village, still beautiful, clings beneath the brow of the wood. The walls of the great chateau remain, and something of the handsome church tower. Its condition, better than its neighbors, offers a practical foundation for rebuilding. Seen against the dark mass of upclimbing wood, even the white flake of ruin adds a decorative touch to the charming picture of red roofs and gray stone. The town is very old. For centuries it has looked out over the vale to the western height crowned by the Bois de Bouche. On the very crest of the wood, where the road runs south to Agneau, lies a tank of the C2 class, the Salon, number 2724, flotsam of the first battle of Cambrai. One of her endless chains broken by a direct hit. She must have run off the roadbed, for she lies tilted at an extravagant angle over an enemy dugout. Another shell struck the roof. The Bosch have stripped her engines and all internal fittings. Nature has taken her to herself, and in her mossy decrepitude she is part and parcel of the soil. For the revolving treads carry on their upper surfaces deposits of earth. On these little gardens have sprung up, the seed borne by birds and the wind. They resemble miniature kindergarten classes, for on this roof of steel now flourish grass and clover, bindweed and buttercup, daisies and ragged robin. Even through her broken tractor a little beech tree struggles. Good tank salon. You did not achieve that eminence, and there render your life until your task was done. For even as you floundered and stopped, there came the sharp yell of the infantry as they fell upon the Bosch gunners with bayonet and bomb. Within a stone's throw to the left, where the raised road gives protection, lies an enemy 5.9-inch battery position. Shells already fused stand in place, but the guns are on their way to the Canadian Corps captured gun park. A light railway turns up to the battery from Fontaine Notre Dame. Most of the dugouts are unfurnished and blind. The Bosch was packing in for the winter, even as we fell upon him. On the west end of the wood is a wonderful opip, built up into the trees, commanding a wide sweep of country in front of the Marquion line and the Canal du Nord. Nearby are two eight-inch guns, captured by Bing the previous November, but not removed and still lying there, rusted and impressive. The top of the wood, intact though it seems from a distance, is blasted. Only splintered trunks remain, and these too must die. The trees in this wood have been nurtured with blood, remarked a captured German officer. But on the southern and eastern slopes the ancient growth of oak and beech is unscathed, clothing the steep hillside. 
blackberries are thick in the underbrush a rabbit pops in and out what a show place for the british tourist says our companion a franc ahead to see the famous wood and the graves let them here amid their sandwiches and orange peel pour out a libation to the heroes of england and of canada who died upon these slopes standing on the crest of burlow wood one surveys the battlefield not alone of today but of november nineteen seventeen from dawn until dark in and around burlow wood four british divisions here withstood overwhelming masses of the enemy and so saved the army from disaster for them perhaps weary and bleeding it was sufficient that they had done their duty as became british soldiers modest steadfast and cheerful in adversity his ingenuity constantly at work to belittle his own part in the show the british soldier whether of the old army or the new is instinct in eminent degree with those qualities of mind and spirit that alone enable him to bear undaunted the brunt of battle the anguish of the long years of trench warfare and so his spirit unshaken win through to final victory such thoughts arise as one looks over the famous field and comes to a german military cemetery where lies honorably buried many of these gallant british soldiers who fell in november nineteen seventeen canada's share in this now common heritage of burlow wood has been recorded in the preceding pages in no battle where her armies were engaged was there greater need for no more successful application of those special qualities of personal initiative and resource such as become second nature to men inured to the free life of the farm the mining camp or the shanty in a land where even the city dweller from his boyhood up is accustomed once a year to take down his rifle from its rack and disappear for a treasured interval into the silent fastnesses of the red deer or moose for these the long winter evenings glow with reminiscences of the chase of toil and hardy adventure they exhibit proudly their trophies they have now been engaged on a more bitter sport and in the years to come those of them who came through will carry a vivid picture of the dark outline of Burnwell Wood, and will cherish the memory of their comrades who lie close and ordered in the Canadian cemetery behind Burgold Town, at foot of the wooded slope. The sad news comes to the Corps at Caen one day that Major General L. J. Lipset, who had so brilliantly commanded the 3rd Canadian Division, until after the close of the battle of arras the preceding month had been killed by a sniper's bullet on october fourteen while reconnoitering in the front line of his new command the fourth british division at the outbreak of the war general lipset who was an officer of the british army and had been lent to the canadian militia was stationed at winnipeg and proceeded immediately to recruit the eighth battalion from the ninetieth winnipeg rifles little black devils of the real rebellion fame taking his unit overseas with the first canadian division it was this battalion that in april nineteen fifteen held the line in the second battle of ypres in face of the enemy's first gas attack general lipset was successively promoted to command of the brigade and the third canadian division where his fine leadership a courage that amounted to recklessness his consideration for his officers and care for his men soon endeared him to all ranks the war however was clearly drawing to a close and there could be no future for a professional soldier of his rank with the reduced canadian militia and so he accepted the offer of the command of the fourth british division regretfully parting from his old comrades but with ahead of him the fairly certain and speedy prospect of a corps command in the British Army. And now he is dead. The Canadian Corps buries him at Caen, where the civil cemetery has long overflowed its bounds to give shelter to friend and foe alike. It is a great and impressive gathering in the drizzling rain of an autumn afternoon, a hollow square of men from every branch of the Canadian Corps, and particularly from his beloved 3rd Division encloses the open grave lying there in the heart of no man's land all round about are solemn hills 
their bare outlines pitted by shell holes and serrated by the white line of trenches while across them stretched dark and forbidding belts of wire presently are heard the poignant strains of a funeral march and the cortege approaches his old battalion the eighth furnishes the firing party the men marching with dragging feet and arms reversed behind walk with bowed heads the corps commander the prince of wales officers of the fourth british division and many of his tried comrades of the canadian corps there is something strikingly impressive even barbaric about the rites of a military funeral and this is heightened by the time the place and the circumstance but at length all is over the funeral oration pronounced the last volley fired the last post sounded a great soldier and a good citizen has been laid to his rest it was the last we were to see of no man's land next day corps headquarters moved to loire end of part four chapter one part four chapter two of canada's hundred days this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesay. Part 4, Chapter 2. Operations. October 6 to 16. Sir Arthur Currie describes the general situation at this period as follows, quote, While the Canadian Corps was tenaciously fighting to break through the hinge of the Hindenburg system of defense, the 3rd and 4th British armies were pushing forward through the devastated areas in the Somme, meeting everywhere strong and determined rear guards. The outer defenses of the Hindenburg line were captured by them on September 18 and 19, and a good position secured for the assault on the main defenses. The storming of the Canal du Nord line, which brought the Canadian Corps definitely behind the areas organized for defense, was immediately followed by the capture of the main Hindenburg line on the fronts of the 3rd and 4th Armies, and on October 8 and 10, the Scheldt Canal was crossed north of Cambrai. Cambrai was seized, and the German rear guards pushed back in open country to the Selle River. The Germans were falling back everywhere. They had now evacuated completely the Lees salient, and a portion of the ground east and south of Linz, but they were still holding a line west of Lille Douai and along the Canal de la Cinci. The Canadian Corps, although tired and depleted in numbers, began to push forward as soon as it had taken over the new front on the Canal de la Cinci, south of Douai. On October 14, the Second Army, in conjunction with Belgian armies and French detachments, attacked the northern part of the salient and precipitated the German retreat. While Cambrai was falling and our Second Division was pushing out east of the city, the First Canadian Division, had taken over its new ground north of the Scarp, and was making headway on a front that had remained practically static since the Canadian Corps, at the end of August, had opened the Battle of Arras. North of the Scarp and of the Cinci, the line of enemy defenses was still intact, that is to say, the Hindenburg Line proper, the drocourt quiant Line, and subsidiary trench systems. It was the possession by the enemy of this terrain that so greatly added to the difficulties encountered by the Canadian Corps throughout their progress from Arras to Cambrai. The time had now come to break through and bring the northern flank into line with our advanced east of Cambrai, an area now transferred to the 22nd Corps. The Canadian Corps, led by the 1st Canadian Division, moving into the area that corps had hitherto held. It followed, therefore, that while hitherto the 22nd Corps 
had occupied the centre of the first army front and the canadian corps its right the positions were reversed the canadian corps becoming the centre and the twenty second corps instead of being on our left were henceforth to be our neighbours on the right a position occupied by the seventeenth corps of the third army our neighbours on our left were now the eighth corps this being the left of the first army its remaining corps the first corps had been transferred with its sector on september twenty to the fifth army operating north of linz on the night of october six to seven the first canadian division took up their new line south of the marshes of the sensee and scarp from pailu where the canal du nord crosses the sensee west to sailly in ostrevent and then northwest to biache saint vast but keeping south of the little trinquis brook the division therefore faced north the second brigade being on the right and the third brigade on the left with the first brigade in support they signaled their presence by a night raid across this watery waste into enemy territory returning with an officer and twenty-three other prisoners the first prisoners by the way captured in this sector during october at five a m on october eighth a chinese attack was put on all sound and fury with no intention of attacking in force the object being to discover the enemy's strength however a post was pushed over and established across the river for purposes of observation october nine the line remained quiet but early next morning our patrols pushed over and captured sailly and then advanced some distance along the kiant drocourt line capturing an officer and forty-seven other ranks the object of this demonstration was if possible to pin the boche down to that front he counter-attacked in great strength and our object being gained we recrossed the river leaving sailly again in his hands these preliminaries had disclosed his dispositions and at three o'clock next morning october eleventh a concerted night attack was made in conjunction with the eighth corps on our left under cover of a great concentration of artillery on our right the second brigade crossed the sensee at tortequina from which the enemy had been blasted by our artillery and seized the dominant feature mont Bedou, a hill to the northwest the attacking troops being the eighth battalion of winnipeg on the right the fifth battalion saskatchewan in the centre and seventh battalion british columbia on the left with the tenth battalion of alberta in support canadian engineers speedily built bridges across all the country being flooded with only two practical causeways on our left the third brigade attacked with the sixteenth battalion canadian scottish of western canada on the right and the fifteenth battalion forty eighth highlanders of toronto on the left both crossing the triqui and then advancing the former in the direction of noyel sous bellon and the latter in the direction of vitry in artois on the scarp where contact was established with the eighth corps which had advanced from its line easterly whereas our advance was due north the design being to cut the enemy out of the triangle formed by the triqui and the scarp the advance was continued throughout the day and by nightfall the second brigade had captured armel estrees and bellon from two to three thousand yards east northeast and north respectively while the third brigade had pushed up to a line one thousand yards south of brebiera only five thousand yards southwest of douay thus on the same day that the second canadian division was capturing iwi about fifteen miles to the southeast the first canadian division holding fourteen thousand yards of front and attacking on a twelve thousand yard frontage employing only two brigades carried its line across a watery waste and penetrated in a northerly direction five to six thousand yards thus threatening to cut off the enemy's retreat through douay 
On our left, the 8th British Division had also a very successful day. Since October 7, it had fought its way from just east of Opi through the friend Rouvois line and now made a frontal attack on the drocourt quiant line north of the Scarpe. Simultaneously with the turning movement of the 1st Canadian Division from the south, quote, at 5.10 a.m. the Middlesex and Devons attacked, says the 1st Army narrative, and at 7 a.m. the drocourt quiant line opposite was taken except for the town of Vitry on the Scarpe. The way in which this formidable line was taken was ingenious and psychological. A heavy barrage was put down, not on the whole line attacked, which would have pinned the enemy to fighting for his dugouts, but only on the extreme southern part of the line. Then slowly, very slowly, 100 yards in 8 minutes. But surely and inevitably it crept northwards extending along the german trenches the men in those trenches still free from death and destruction raining down further south saw it creeping 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 nearer and more near the tension was increased by the slowness of the barrage extension it was too much and the boche decided not to wait for what was coming but to get out while the opportunity offered a moving description, but the psychology of the enemy seems to have changed somewhat since those bitter days six weeks before when the Canadian Corps drove him out of the Drocourt Quiant line on the south side of the Scarp. Meantime, a platoon of the Middlesex had crossed the Scarp at Vitry, this narrative continues, and taken Montmetier, a commanding position about 1,000 yards south of the river. This was trespassing the south of the river was the canadian sector so to them it was handed over and its possession much assisted their advance our attack followed up the retiring enemy and by nightfall the line ran from well beyond beaumont round Cuinchy, a very pronounced central salient and back to the scarp about six hundred yards east of vitry the advance ranged from four thousand yards on the flanks to eight thousand in the centre the berkshires were here and gave us much material and stores which the enemy had no time to remove or destroy from this moment until the eighth division in its victorious advance crossed the scarp and entered douay the enemy fought for every bit of ground using many concealed artillery and machine-gun positions while we had a great deal of wire to pass booby traps of varied and ingenious kinds were everywhere odd bits of timber apparently thrown carelessly down helmets strands of wire all among the harmless debris and material left by the retreating enemy on october twelfth the attack was continued our first brigade coming into the line and a wide pivoting movement being carried out based on our Lou which had been captured by the 56th British Division, now under the Canadian Corps command. All three brigades of the 1st Canadian Division advanced in line, their left flank sweeping the south bank of the Scarp, until by nightfall they had cleared the enemy out of the triangle formed by the Scarp, the Canal du Nord, and the Sensee, and held a line on the west bank of the Canal du Nord between Arlou and Corbenham, this marked in thirty hours an advance on the pivoting wing of nine thousand yards many prisoners and a considerable number of machine guns being captured the next few days were spent in preparing for a concerted attack by the canadian corps whose divisions were now reunited on the right the second canadian division which had relieved the eleventh british division and held a line from bouchain west to aubenchul Obak, was to cross the flooded area of the sensee attacking in a northerly direction in the centre the fourth canadian division which was coming up in relief of the fifty sixth british division was to make a similar attack from aubenchul Obak, west to arlou and on the left the first canadian division was to storm the line of the canal du nord 
north of the Sensee and advance in an easterly direction. The 3rd Canadian Division was under orders to relieve our 1st Division, but in the event, so swift was our advance that the relief could not be made until some days after the date determined. Sir Arthur Currie in his dispatch thus describes the events of these days. Quote, the new front of the Canadian Corps, at 5 p.m. October 11, extended from iwi denain Railway north of Iwi to the Scheldt Canal at Estrun, thence following the southern bank of the Canal de la Sensee to Paluel, thence crossing the Sensee River at Amel to the Scarp River east of Vitry. The front was held by the 2nd Canadian Division from the right to the Scheldt Canal, the 11th Division from Estrun, inclusive, to Obenschul au Bac, exclusive, the 56th Division from Obenschul au Bac, inclusive, to Paluel, inclusive, and the 1st Canadian Division from Paluel, exclusive, to the western boundary. The fronts of the 11th and 56th Divisions were then stationary, but on the front of the 1st Canadian Division, crossings had been forced over the Cinci and Trinquis rivers that morning, and the enemy was retiring, closely followed by battle patrols of the 1st Canadian Division. The 1st Canadian Division had relieved the 4th British Division in the line along the south side of the valleys of the Cinci and Trinquis rivers, from Paluel exclusive to the Scarp during the nights of October 5-6 to 6 and 6-7, to 7, coming under orders of the 22nd Corps. The front had been a quiet one, the river valleys having been flooded by the enemy to an average width of from 300 to 400 yards, and the bridges destroyed. On the morning of October 8, the division carried out a Chinese attack with a view to ascertaining the enemy's probable action if attacked. Under the cover of the barrage, patrols succeeded in enlarging the small bridgehead across the river at Saili in Ostrabant, capturing 24 prisoners and two machine guns. The enemy was expected to withdraw shortly, and this barrage was repeated daily at dawn with the object of harassing the enemy and testing his strength. At 3 a.m. October 10, Battle patrols were pushed out by the 3rd Canadian Infantry Brigade, Brigadier General G. S. Tuxford, from the bridgehead at Saili, and after capturing the village, they entered the Drocourt Quillot line to the northeast. Thirty prisoners and six machine guns were sent back from Saili at daylight. A strong enemy counterattack, estimated at two battalions, overran the force in the Drocourt Quillot line and recaptured Saili, driving our line back to the line previously held. On October 11, in conjunction with an attack on the left by the 8th Division, our troops forced their way over the narrow crossings of the Sinsi and Trinqui rivers in the face of considerable machine-gun fire, and pushed northwards and eastwards, meeting only resistance from isolated machine-gun nests. The performance of the first patrols in forcing their way across the narrow causeways, all stoutly defended by machine guns, was a splendid achievement. By the night of October 11, the 1st Canadian Division on the left had reached the line Amel S3 Noyel, all inclusive, and at dawn October 12 pushed forward, clearing Adu and reaching the west bank of the canal from Paluel to the Scarp. On October 12, the line remained stationary between the Canal du Nord and the Scheldt Canal. East of the Scheldt Canal, the 2nd Canadian Division attacked at noon in conjunction with the 22nd Corps on the right and captured Ordain. Attempts to push forward to Basseville were, however, stopped by machine gun fire. The restricted area and the inundated condition of the ground prevented further progress on this front until the troops on the right could get forward. It was apparent from many indications that the enemy was preparing to carry out a withdrawal on a large scale. 
prisoners reported the evacuation of civilians and the removal or destruction of all stores also that roads and railways had been prepared for demolition these statements were confirmed by our observers who reported numerous and frequent explosions and fires behind the enemy's lines on the canadian corps front the divisions in the line were confronted by the canal de la Sensee, and this in its flooded condition was a serious obstacle the few crossings possible being narrow and easily defended orders were issued however that a policy of aggressive patrolling should be adopted to detect at the earliest moment any retirement and that all preparation should be made for an immediate and rapid pursuit our patrols were most daring during the next few days but no weak spot was to be found along the enemy front our attempts at crossing the canal being stopped by heavy machine gun and rifle fire during the night of october twelfth to thirteen the second canadian division extended its left to obenschul obach exclusive relieving the eleventh division in the line with the fourth canadian infantry brigade brigadier general g e mcquaig on the right and the sixth canadian infantry brigade brigadier general a ross on the left at this stage the g o c fifty sixth division represented that his troops were too weak and tired to carry out the vigorous pursuit required in case of an enemy withdrawal the fourth canadian division was therefore ordered to relieve the fifty sixth division by the morning of october sixteenth and in the meantime to place one brigade at the disposal of the g o c fifty sixth division to be used in following up the enemy on october thirteenth the 10th canadian infantry brigade which had been resting in arras was accordingly moved up to marquion and came into reserve under the fifty sixth division during the early morning of october thirteenth the fifty sixth division crossed the canal and succeeded in establishing a bridgehead at aubigny au bac capturing the village with two hundred and one prisoners at ten p m the following night however an enemy counter-attack in strength caused our withdrawal from the village but the bridgehead was retained the relief of the fifty sixth division by the fourth canadian division was carried out on the nights of october fourteen to fifteen and fifteen to sixteen without incident and the former moved back to rest in the arras haute avin marui area coming into army reserve patrols of the first canadian division succeeded in crossing the canal near ferin on its left brigade front during the early morning of october fourteenth but meeting strong resistance the parties withdrew taking with them some prisoners and machine guns end of part four chapter two recording by james o'connor randolph massachusetts december two thousand ten Part 4, Chapter 3 of Canada's Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesay. Part 4, Chapter 3 The Advance on Denain. On October 17th, the 1st Canadian Division crossed the Canal du Nord the 1st Brigade on the left, effecting their passage in the morning, followed by the 2nd Brigade on their right. Troops of the 4th Canadian Division, unable to make headway by a direct assault on the line of the Sensi, swung out to their left, crossing over the Canal du Nord, and then working east along the north bank of the Sensi, clearing out opposition as they went, chiefly from enemy machine-gun posts. Later in the day the 2nd Canadian Division, in the neighborhood of oise au bac with troops of the 6th Brigade, succeeded in gaining a footing on the north bank on the following morning october eighteenth the fourth brigade attacked the eighteenth battalion western ontario and the nineteenth battalion of toronto crossing over on a footbridge between payancourt and estrun and advancing as far as wavershain 
Canadian engineers followed up closely, constructing pontoon and steel bridges over both the canal and river. The enemy had blown every crossing, and demolished causeways and railway bridges, their engineers showing remarkable efficiency in this work of destruction. Fog blotted out the landscape, favoring the retreat. After the crossing had been effected, our troops advanced several miles, with patrols thrown out in front, in a vain endeavor to get in touch with enemy rearguards. For days to come the mist hung low over the countryside, and our airmen were powerless. In these days magnificent work was done by corps signals, who pushed their telegraph lines ahead abreast of the advance, thus keeping all units in touch, a remarkable feat, for in the textbooks it had never been contemplated that in open warfare of the nature now developing, wire communications could thus be maintained. But the work was carried forward right up to Mons, and after the armistice through Belgium to the Rhine. Once the north bank of the Sensee had been cleared, our advance went forward practically unchecked for several days. Canadian railway troops had been brought up to repair communications, but our progress quite outpaced their utmost efforts, and the troops pressed on, often with but meagre rations, yet stimulated by the prospect of liberating civilians in the next village ahead, and there again encouraged to fresh exertions. It was claimed for the 1st Brigade, Brigadier General W. A. Griesbach, that its troops were first to enter Douai. It had been evacuated of its civilian population, and might have been a city of the dead, for there was no sign of life other than a few sentries. A block of buildings on the Rue de Paris, fronting the Grande Place, had been burned, but otherwise there was no sign of intentional demolition, such as had characterized the enemy evacuation of Cambrai. The magnificent old Hôtel de Ville was intact, and now floating over it once again was the tricolor. But within was evidence of systematic sack, historic pictures having been taken from their frames, and even the great gilt candelabra removed from the ceilings, but left heaped on the floor in the hurry of the retreat. Only the wonderful frescoes on the walls of the banquet hall remained. Here again the town had been given over to sack by the soldiery, Shops had been looted, and every private house entered and its contents of value removed, with the same wanton destruction of what was left that had marked Cambrai. In the cathedral, a great pile of altar furnishings and vestments, on the floor, showed that had time been given, these two would have gone. The same sack had been carried out in all the evacuated villages, but as the retreat gained momentum, with our men close upon its heels, this evacuation of civilians could no longer be effected by the retreating enemy. For our troops in their concentric movement on Denain often entered villages at one end while the Bash were leaving at the other, and yet already the tricolor so carefully hid these long years had broken out from every window, and the glad villagers weeping for joy crowded around impeding our advance though still was heard the rattle of machine-guns, and occasionally a shell would burst in the narrow street. From their slender store they pressed upon our soldiers coffee and bread, and garlanded the guns with flowers. Vive les Canadiens! Long live our liberators, and glory to the heroes, hung in great streamers across the village square. On October 21st, Canadian Corps headquarters moved to Loire, a village on the douai Denain road. Just beyond was Auberchicor, a typical industrial village, whose rows of bright brick cottages recalled the Lens area, with its glassworks and the fosses, conical heaps of slag, rising up from the flatness of the plain, indicating the pit mouths. The bash had wrecked these mines, flooding their levels and blowing up their shafts, damage that it must take years to repair. We had come to the borders of the most valuable industrial district of France and everywhere was ruin. A curious example of German psychology exists in the village of Loard on the walls of a barn converted by the Bash into a concert hall. The artist, of no mean talent, used these flat spaces to exhibit a series of three pictures that might well bear the motto, As ye sow, so shall we reap. In the first of these, a long horizontal panel, a finely drawn bull is seen drawing a heavy wooden plough. In the furrow guiding it strains a young Frenchwoman, flat-breasted and dulled by field labor, but with still a meager beauty. The next depicts an old Frenchman, nodded and bowed, sowing the field. A little boy toddles beside him. Behind is a village church and a windmill. 
With savage fidelity the artist makes mute despair the keynote of both these groups, of the woman straining at the plough, and the old man wearily casting the seed. For here cannot be that joy of labour that even as it plants sees in the long months to follow first the tender sprouting blade, then the wind upon the grain, the harvest field, and the safe garnered fruits of the earth in neatly ordered stacks awaiting the thresher. Despair dragging at their feet, they toil to make fat the destroyer. Relentlessly the third picture drives home this horrid truth. Swinging a scythe in the yellowing cornfields is the great central figure of a Prussian soldier, terrible, with the same unerring fidelity, a ferocious crouching figure of long arms, knotted hands, and widespread legs, repulsive as the gorilla. Power it has, and strength and cunning. The wheat sheaves bow before it. With a fine compelling touch of irony, the artist fills in his background with marching German soldiers, force directing the harvest. He has taken away with him everything. Not a horse nor a cow, a pig nor a hen, is left in the country. In one village he has even taken the nanny goat whose milk was keeping alive a sick child. He burned the straw he threshed. Where he could not remove grain he scattered it over the barnyard. As for the peasants' houses, they are stripped. The sack has been systematic. We captured at Lewarde a trainload of furniture taken from this village, still standing on the siding all neatly packed and labelled, by order of the army command. Little groups of peasants, old men, women, and children, push before them their hand-carts piled high with what household belongings they could take when evacuated. They come back to their villages to find but empty shells, the accumulations of patient generations of labour scattered to the four winds, or lying soiled and broken on floors deliberately befouled. But they return free citizens of a free nation. Over their threshold is the tricolor, and they are at home. Ah, such scenes! Following hard on the enemy, a field battery comes to a stream where the bridge has been broken down. Seizing picks and shovels, the ecstatic villagers break down barns and garden walls to make a crossing. This not going fast enough, they throw in mattresses, bedsteads, and whatever movables the Bosch have left. Bravo! Bravo! they cry as the first gun crosses and gallops up the road. The villagers east of Douai, whom the Bosch had no time to evacuate, are better off. Though their livestock is gone, they have preserved their furniture. Their houses are exquisitely neat and clean, the tiled floor spotless, and kitchen utensils shining. By contrast they make the work of the Bosch elsewhere more beastly. Such a village is red, lying in a loop of the scarp, northeast of Montigny, where in the chateau our first brigade has its headquarters and one of its bedroom doors bears the inscription in chalk, Feldmarschall Hindenburg, a very recent visitor, the villagers say. An enemy battalion had been quartered in Vred for years, but its people have a proper pride, for not a village girl listened to the Bosch, and no bedraggled damsels followed the retreating army, more than can be said for every village. They were eager to see Canadian troops, and so, although this village is outside the northern boundary of the Canadian Corps, one Sunday afternoon, Lieutenant Colonel A. W. Sparling of the 1st Battalion, billeted near, marches in with his band playing. It becomes a fete day. The villagers, scant though their means, insist on providing refreshments for the entire battalion, with many cups of coffee, or the bitter substitute that goes by that name. Children bring great bouquets of flowers, asters and chrysanthemums. From intimate talk with these villagers, one is able to gather a picture of just what the enemy occupation has meant. Other villagers fared worse where the soldiery was brutal and licentious. In Vred it was a continual struggle for existence. They were robbed of their rations issued by the American mission, and more lately by the Spanish, for after drawing them they were requisitioned by soldiers, who gave in return sauerkraut and black bread. "'To your good health, madame,' said a bash officer as he munched American biscuits. They had no fresh meat for years, but for their garden produce they would have starved. Cabbage soup was the mainstay. Able-bodied men were drafted away to work in trenches, and the young women taken to the forests, receiving for their labor scanty pay in German paper currency, now worthless. These privations are stamped upon every face. 
malnutrition caused many deaths. One quarter of the village population, according to the battalion M.O., are sick from this cause. Voluntarily, our men have assigned 20% of their rations to the villagers. But they need careful dieting and nursing. Many of the children, wizened mites, can never be robust. They must carry the mark of the Bosch to their grave. To see all this, to have brought thus intimately home the perils and suffering of both body and spirit of these long years, makes what our soldiers have accomplished all so immensely worth while. One of our men is carrying a little child. Others cling about him. We are fully repaid, he says, for all we have gone through. Our dead have not died in vain. Our gaping wounds are bathed in grateful tears. Let no mother nor wife nor sister in Canada feel, if they ever felt, that their boys gave their lives merely for an abstraction, even for so great and splendid an ideal as truth and honor and justice. They died that living people, good people, true people, might be freed from physical bonds and be restored to spiritual life. In every little home is a crucifix and the signs of humble devotion. A pious, earnest, sober, frugal people, these French peasants. Narrow, perhaps, in vision, but firm of soul. The knight errantry of Canada might have sought the world over, and the ages through, for a people in distress more worthy of a righteous war of liberation. Through long generations the memory of these days, the coming of the Canadians, and the bursting asunder of fetters, will be cherished in steadfast French hearts. Meanwhile, we had been pushing on. On October 18th, the line had reached to west of Bouchain, west of Auberchicourt, with Marquette and Montigny inclusive. From October 18th to 19th, a considerable advance was made, which resulted in the capture by the 4th Canadian Division, on October 19th, of the important town of Denain. On October 18th, the 11th Brigade captured Auberchicourt, Aniche, and Abscon, 102nd Battalion, and on October 19th, Escodin, 54th Battalion. On its right, the 2nd Canadian Division captured Bouchain, Mastang, Rules, and Lourche, while on our left, the 1st Canadian Division captured Brouet, Somain, Fenem, Air, Horneng, and Halez. This period is summed up by the Corps commander thus. Test barrages were carried out on the Corps front each morning to ascertain the enemy's strength and attitude and on October 17th the enemy was found extremely quiet, and did not retaliate to our artillery fire on the front of the 1st Canadian Division. Patrols were therefore sent out on that front, and succeeded in crossing the Canal du Nord in several places, meeting only slight opposition. Stronger patrols followed and made good progress. On the front of the 4th Canadian Division, however, all attempts to cross the canal were still met by machine-gun fire. After the 1st Canadian Division had secured crossings, a battalion of the 4th Canadian Division was sent up to take advantage of these crossings, and working down the east side of the canal, cleared the enemy on the 4th Canadian Division front, and enabled the advance to commence there. Further to the right, at Hem Lenglet, the 2nd Canadian Division succeeded in crossing the canal later in the day, and patrols were pushed on in the direction of Oisno Bac. Only enemy rearguards were encountered during the day and the opposition was nowhere heavy, although more organized and stubborn on the right opposite the 2nd Canadian Division. By 6 a.m. October 18th, practically all of the infantry of the 1st and 4th Canadian Divisions, and several battalions of the 2nd Canadian Division, were across the canal, and the following towns had been liberated. Ferrin, Courchelet, Gaulzin, La Raquette, Vieux-au-Tertre, Kenton, Rucourt, Brunemont, aubigny Aubac, Fechain, Frassain, Bunicourt, and Hemlinlet. During that day, two armoured cars, one squadron of the Canadian Light Horse, and one company of Canadian Corps cyclists from the Brutinelles Brigade, were attached to each of the 1st and 4th Canadian Divisions to assist in the pursuit of the enemy. These troops remained under the leading divisions throughout subsequent operations, and rendered valuable service to the divisions to which they were attached, although the enemy's very complete road destruction prevented the armoured cars from operating to their full extent. Throughout the advance now begun, a great amount of work was thrown upon the engineers, and their resources in men and material were taxed to the utmost. 
the enemy's demolition had been very well planned and thoroughly carried out, all bridges over the canals and streams being destroyed, every crossroad and road junction rendered impassable by the blowing of large mines, and the railways, light and standard, blown up at frequent intervals. The enemy also considerably impeded our progress by his clever manipulation of the water levels in the canals which he controlled. Footbridges were first thrown across the canal, and these were quickly followed by heavier types of bridges to carry battalion transport and artillery, and in addition eight heavy traffic bridges, ranging in length from ninety to a hundred and sixty feet, were at once put under way. On the front of the 1st Canadian Division on the left, the enemy drained the canal, and it was found impossible to complete and use the pontoon bridges first commenced. The engineers in the forward area concentrated their efforts on road repair, craters being quickly filled in, for the most part with material gathered on the spot and found in enemy dumps. In addition, the whole areas were searched immediately after their occupation, many booby traps and delayed action mines being discovered and rendered harmless, and all water supply sources being tested. It was clear from the wholesale destruction of roads and railways that the reconstruction of communications would be very slow, and that it would be difficult to keep our troops supplied. Canadian railway troops were brought up, and as soon as the enemy had been cleared away from the canal, work was commenced on the repairing of the standard gauge railway forward from Sochi Lestray. The construction of a railway bridge over the canal, at Aubenchuel au Bac, was immediately commenced. The enemy retirement now extended considerably north of our front, and the 8th Corps on our left began to move forward. During October 18th, rapid and fairly easy progress was made, and the following towns and villages were liberated from the enemy. Deschy, saint lenoble Guisnain, Montigny, Pequincourt, Loffre, Le Rord, Urchin, Masny, Ecaillon, Marquette, Oisnobac, and the western portions of Aubercicourt and Montchicourt. During the day the advance had carried us into a large industrial area, and well-built towns became more frequent. It also liberated the first of a host of civilians, two thousand being found in Pequincourt and a few in Aubercicourt. These people had been left by the retiring army without food, and faced as we were by an ever-lengthening line of communication, and with only one bridge yet available for anything but horse transport, the work of the supply services was greatly increased. This additional burden was, however, cheerfully accepted, and the liberated civilians, whose number exceeded 70,000 before Valenciennes was reached, as well as our rapidly advancing troops, were at no time without a regular supply of food. Allusion has been made to the fog, which for days impeded our advance, the sun not being seen for the ten-day period October 14th to 23rd and for two days it rained continuously, making the roads a quagmire. The Bosch could not have selected a better time for making his getaway. Progress was very tedious, because besides destroying all bridges and railway tracks, he had blown enormous craters at every crossroad. Difficulties of observation have been referred to, but the absence of information from our air scouts was to some degree supplied by the efficient work of our intelligence officers, aided by the Corps cavalry, mounted infantry, and cyclists. It was impossible, of course, to say with the same definiteness what forces the enemy had on our front, as had been done so wonderfully in all the fighting up to the close of the Battle of Cambrai, and the connection is appropriate for recording something of that phase of corps operations. Throughout the heavy fighting from August 8th to October 12th, the Canadian Corps commander and his staff were kept accurately and constantly informed of the enemy's strength and dispositions and to the uninitiated there was something almost of magic in the positive statements issued daily by the Intelligence Department of the Corps, as to the enemy elements opposing us, what units had been washed out by our attacks, what reserves had been brought up, whence they came, and their battle history, all illustrated by maps showing battery positions, areas of troops and support, and so on. Unremitting and unflagging, the great military detective force carries on its work silently and without any sort of public recognition in the daily official reports of operations. But through its exertions our troops have the vital advantage that instead of fumbling in the dark, they can walk straight in the light of day. In the early years of the war the enemy's intelligence was superior to our own, but in its closing period the situation was reversed. 
and particularly as he fell back and thus lost touch with his agencies and the attacking force, his blunders became very patent. On the other hand, we were admirably served, and in no quarter more so than by our own intelligence officers. There were, of course, subterranean channels, and much information was collated from a careful study of the air photographs, a work carried on with great thoroughness and gallantry by the RAF. But the most certain source of information lay through identification of prisoners, and this was reduced to such a pitch of scientific skill that half an hour after a show opened, our intelligence officers at Canadian Corps headquarters were able to enumerate the divisions opposed to us. Its agents were right up in the firing line, and identification of enemy units began there and then. More elaborate and intimate work was done in the various divisional cages, and finally at the central clearing house, the Corps' cage for prisoners of war. Here, men speaking perfectly the German tongue, and apparently prisoners themselves, moved freely about, gathering information, and prisoners showing a disposition to talk were interrogated at length. This service, as indeed the whole conduct of operations, can only be carried on successfully with the close cooperation of Corps signals. Fighting a battle is as much a concentrated business as a Christmas mail-order service. Every department must function or the whole will fall to pieces. Before a shot is fired, the work of the general staff is completed. Many days and nights have been employed in preparation, and it is only when the battle starts that its members can lean back in their chairs and take a moment of ease. They have done their part. The execution of the plan is left to others. During the progress of the battle, a tremendous strain is thrown on signals, which must keep all units in close touch with their headquarters, the brigades with their divisions, these latter with corps headquarters. Nor is this all. They must maintain uninterrupted the all-important liaison between the infantry and artillery. A loss of communication at a critical moment of the advance must mean the useless sacrifice of many lives, for our counter-battery work is of vital value to the attacking troops. Not less important is the work of preparation. As intelligence is the eyes, so signals are the ears of the general staff. A good illustration is furnished by the record of operations established by the Canadian Corps Signal Service on Sunday, September 1st, when preparations were completing for the assault next morning on the famous drocourt Quint line. On that day, 7,811 messages were handled, to say nothing of the Corps Telephone Service, 2,440 being by dispatch riders and the balance by land wires or wireless. This requires a large staff of telegraph operators, both on the land and wireless services, and these have been recruited from the pick of the profession in Canada, from the news agency staffs, commercial telegraph companies, and broker offices. They carry on under very difficult conditions, frequently exposed to shell fire and night bombing raids. Especially in the wireless, they reach a high standard of proficiency, and some of these latter became acquainted with the enemy wireless calls, a knowledge that occasionally proves of great value. Thus, when a Canadian wireless section was sent up to Flanders just before the opening of the Amiens show, this knowledge enabled them to completely mislead the enemy as to our intentions, and confirmed his intelligence in its belief that the Canadian Corps was to be thrown in on that front. This particular branch is known as the I talk section, the interception branch of the wireless section, and it was said that our intelligence had the enemy code six months ahead. Hazardous indeed is the work of the cable linesmen who construct and repair wires under fire, suffering many casualties. A gallant story is told of two signalers of a Manitoba field battery, chums who had fought together since the Battle of Ypres Salient. It was just before the opening of the Drocourt Quench show when it was vitally important that telephone connection between the battery and brigade headquarters should be maintained at all costs. They discovered that the line was down, and though the enemy was strafing with very deadly shell fire, they methodically went to work to find and repair the break. This done, they discovered that other batteries on the line were cut off, and they proceeded to repair the whole line, just getting their OK as zero hour struck. One of them was wounded subsequently, while employed on similar work. In the opening phase of an attack, when we were pushing ahead rapidly, it was of course essential that signals keep up with the advance. Thus, by the night of September 27th, they had pushed forward an air line 8,500 yards, or one and a half miles east of the Canal du Nord. Such examples are typical of the spirit actuating the entire signal service, not least efficient members of whom are the dispatch riders. 
who, enveloped in white dust or coated in mud, pursue their course unheeding over broken and shell-tossed roads, familiar figures of the battlefield, more often than not compelled to wobble their motorcycles along the ditch when passing moving troops. End of Part 4, Chapter 3「Part four, Chapter Four of Canada's Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesay. Part four, Chapter Four. Operations, October 20 to 30. One of the difficulties of our advance at this time is the fact that we are unable to shoot the Bosch out of towns and villages because of the civilian population. Thus at Denain, the advance of the 4th Canadian Division was held up for some time on this account, and it was not until the evening of October 20 that our men entered the town, and even then Bosch machine gunners were still clinging to the eastern outskirts. This honor fell to the 10th Brigade, the 47th Battalion, Western Ontario, actually passing through the town together with the 4th Canadian machine gunners. They met there a royal welcome. Never will men of the Canadian Corps forget Denain. The private in the ranks fared as well and was made as much one of the family as the officer. It is a humble little manufacturing town, with nothing about it of beauty or architectural excellence. Its streets are squalid and dirty, the country dull and flat, relieved only by the pyramid-like slag heaps. We were to visit many fine places, and live in fat quarters from Mons on to the palaces of Bonn, with a bathtub for each soldier. But in all this clustered memory, no jewel shines so bright, so constant, and with such a hidden fire as this of the kind folk of Denain. They struck no medals, they named no public squares in our honor, but they gave us their whole heart and with it their uttermost possession, Denain, grimy little town of shining and cherished memory. From the blighted village of Louvard, Canadian Corps headquarters moved into comfortable billets, and in Denain we enjoyed after many weeks the luxury of clean linen and all the ameliorations of civilization. Our billet was in the modest home of a widowed lady in the boulevard Caramon. The story of the family was very simple. The eldest son, a priest, had joined the army at the opening of the war and was somewhere in the Vosges, the second son on another front. In those days this lady had kept house with her youngest son, John, and two daughters, Louise, now age 16, and Yvonne, age 13. German officers coming and going continually had been billeted upon them. But we had no converse with them, said Madame Lesage. There were their rooms, clean and sweet for the dirty fellows. But in those four years, as they tramped day by day up and down stairs, we had nothing to say to them. Once only, Louise here slapped the face of one of them. Yes, our little Louise is of a courage. Here, you must know, was a hospital for English prisoners, broken down by toil and want, and a good physician of Denain devoted himself entirely to their aid and comfort. Little as the people here had themselves, they smuggled food to these poor men, and our Louise, too, slipping behind the back of a sentry, took them little packets. Any they caught, they whipped or imprisoned and threatened to kill and our jean too 
John, did we not tell you about our beloved John, monsieur? burst in little Yvonne. He was going to l'ecole militaire when war broke out to become an officier, and we lied about his age when they registered us all. But last year a neighbor, a despicable traitor, told the Bosch he was eighteen and training for a soldier. So they took him away. They took him away, and we have never heard. They had had no word of any of them for weeks and weeks, no word at all of Jean. These people were reduced to the barest necessities of life, and with our coming, conditions for a time were even worse, for the Spanish relief ceased, and it was some time before we could organize anything beyond the rations of the army. In four years they had not tasted sugar. In this beautiful little menage, one blushed continually to find that to be a Canadian was of necessity to be also a hero, a soldier of transcendent qualities, for in Denan, long before our coming, the renown and fame of the Canadian Corps had gone before. Many a jolly Canadian soldier no doubt recounted here to a breathless household how he too had stormed Vimy Ridge and taken part in the victories of Amiens and Cambrai. The Vimy Ridge tradition, in fact, was to be expected here, for Denain and Linz are situate on the same coal scene and have a community of interest. Certainly there was nothing artificial or put on about this high renown into which we had so unexpectedly entered. It was a thing of growth and root. We luxuriated in it and nowhere we went thereafter had for us quite the same exotic warmth of welcome. Indeed, we were to visit prosperous communities, talk with well-informed people, and find to our sad disappointment they were completely ignorant on the great subject of the Canadian Corps. It is true we left them in better case. All this found fitting expression in a solemn service of thanksgiving celebrated one Sunday in the old church, to which Canadian soldiers were specially invited, and when a memorial service was held for the Canadian dead who had fallen, the Corps Commander, the Prince of Wales, Sir David Watson, commander of the 4th Canadian Division, which captured the town, and his staff were present. One was talking many months after with a demobilized soldier. Take it all in, he said. There was no place like Dana. I never slept in so good a bed before or since. The woman of the house insisted on cleaning my boots. We are shortly to move on to Valenciennes, where, in an imposing mansion, one's billet was cheerless. No clean sheets, no bright fire none of those amenities to which one had become so quickly accustomed. From there, in due course, we moved to Mons, to another mansion, where the Chatelaine, an aged Belgian lady, greets us by saying that the German officers who had just left were true gentlemen, and she hoped we should behave as well. And again, no clean sheets, no brisk fire. Happily, in those days, a reasonable excuse presents itself to return to Denain, to Madame and Louise and Yvonne. One knocks at the familiar door, and Yvonne rushes out. Oh, monsieur, monsieur, how splendid! You are just in time to see our big brother, who has arrived this day on leave, and we have had a letter from our Jean, who is well and will soon be home. We shake hands with a bearded giant in light blue. He thanks us again and again. For what? We cannot tell. For perhaps accepting so gracefully the kindness poured upon us. But it is fine to hear that this veteran of France also has the very highest opinion of Le Corps Canadien, has heard of its exploits in the far Vosges. Somewhere in Belgium a little letter overtakes us from Yvonne. They are all united again after four years. What happiness! From Denan on the fighting stiffened, and as we were well out in front of troops on either flank, 
we advanced cautiously, pushing ahead only when ground could be gained with a minimum of casualties. Nevertheless, it was our object to prevent the enemy getting away at leisure, and we trod closely on his heels, our outposts feeling their way along and driving in his rear guards. Thus his main body was never more than four to six hours ahead, and we prevented him wrecking the country in his passage, though it was systematically sacked and looted, while the dirt and stench he left behind him were indescribable. In dealing with enemy posts, a return to some of the practice of trench warfare obtained. Stokes guns, with a range of 500 yards, whose day was regarded as done once we forsook a warfare of positions, now came into play, and even more effective were the Newton mortars, with a range of 1,200 yards. Bits of cover were utilized to bring these up within range of the enemy machine gun nests, and at the first round the Bosch gunners had their wind up and got off. Very effective work was done with these guns mounted in armored cars, of which a supply from Brutonel's brigade had been divided among the brigades and were placed in attack directly under battalion commanders. They were thus enabled to circulate on various roads and outflank small machine gun nests and positions that had been holding up the infantry, causing considerable casualties to the enemy and materially assisting the advance. This open warfare through a rolling country provided a magnificent training for our troops, who fast closed up the scars of recent fighting and soon presented a fresh and smart appearance. They were in excellent spirits, the only grievance being the ever-lengthening distance from the leave base, a real hardship for the men whose turn it was. Except the units actually in the line, and these were but few, for our brigades attacked at the most on a two-battalion front, while the 11th Brigade in particular, Brigadier General Odlum, advanced all the way from the Canal du Nord to Valenciennes and beyond on a one-battalion front. The nature of the present operations rather resembled peacetime maneuvers than the battle tactics to which our troops had been habituated. On October 20, the 2nd Canadian Division went back to rest, the 4th Canadian Division having established contact at Denain with the 51st Division, advancing from the south on the right bank of the Scheldt. On this date, still further progress was made, the 1st Canadian Division capturing Asnon and Valers, and the 4th Canadian Division, Avalui, this village being taken by the 54th Battalion of the Kootenay. By October 21, the 1st Canadian Division had penetrated the Foray de Vicoigne to the road leading from Valenciennes northwest to Saint Armand, while the 4th Canadian Division had captured the following villages Vavrechain, Rouveny, and Prouvy by units of the 10th Brigade, and Bellard, Arian, and Aubry by the 11th Brigade with the 87th Battalion, Grenadier Guards of Montreal. Its outpost line was on the western outskirts of La Sentinelle and Petite Foray. On October 22, the 1st Canadian Division, which had battled its way forward without a halt from northeast of Arras on October 6, was relieved by the 3rd Canadian Division. Next day, we had reached a line along the Scheldt Canal to the Faubourg de Paris, thence along the canal to Fresnes, thence to Odom, fronting on the Scheldt opposite Condé. The advance was continued with the 4th Canadian Division on the right and the 3rd Canadian Division on the left, the 10th Brigade being on our extreme right along the left bank of the Scheldt, south of which was the area of the 22nd Corps. On the left of the 10th was the 11th Brigade, working on a line drawn from just north of Denain through Anzin, the northwestern suburb of Valenciennes. 
left again was the ninth brigade and beyond them the seventh brigade working along the northern boundary of the corps which ran from douay to the northern fringe of the foray de rasmus some fourteen thousand yards north of valenciennes north of us was the eighth corps everywhere civilians were released and we did what was possible to relieve their necessities it was a triumphal progress their joy and contempt of danger were extravagant and in a country that so far had escaped the ravages of war they appeared to have no idea of the perils wherein they moved thus when the seventy fifth battalion of toronto passed through Anzine into the village of beauvrage north of valenciennes the civilians brought them coffee regardless of the heavy machine-gun fire from the far side of the scheldt an old peasant was serving coffee to two of our men when a shell burst in his back yard they immediately died for the cellar crying au cave monsieur au cave but with shattered glass around him he proceeded methodically to make up his charcoal fire the enemy indeed kept up a heavy fire all along the canal and paid special attention to our exposed communications a number of our men and even the eleventh brigade staff being badly gassed emaciated though they were the frenchmen of military age thus repatriated hurried off to enlist pitiable was the condition of british prisoners several of whom were now released the boche made it a crime for the peasantry to give them so much as a cup of water and set to heavy work in their weakened condition most of them were little better than skeletons a canadian trooper of the fort garry horse of winnipeg captured in november nineteen seventeen when his squadron was surrounded south of cambrai and who now made good his escape from valenciennes weighed only eighty six pounds his proper weight being one hundred and sixty pounds he said the boche admitted they were beaten and that they were going back to germany the condition of captured german horses showed the straits to which they were reduced the operations of this period are described by sir arthur currie as follows Quote, on october nineteen the advance was continued on the whole corps front nearly forty towns and villages being wrested from the enemy including the large town of denain the twenty second corps advancing on our right from the south gained touch with the fourth canadian division just east of denain on the evening of october nineteen pinching out the second canadian division which was then concentrated in the aubergine corps area where good billets were available in spite of bad weather and increased resistance more ground was gained on october twenty and the villages of asnon les faux valere and avalui with a large population were freed during the day resistance had stiffened all along the line the ground over which we were advancing was very flat and there was no tactical advantage to be gained by pushing forward and a further advance would also increase the difficulties of supply in addition on the left the eighth corps had not been able to cope with the supply question and had not advanced in conformity with our progress in view of these considerations orders were issued that divisions were to maintain touch with the enemy without becoming involved in heavy fighting for a time on october twenty the fourth canadian division was held up just east of denain by machine-gun and artillery fire and it was not until late in the afternoon that our troops could make progress there continuing the advance on october twenty one a footing was gained in the foray de vicoigne and the following villages were captured arimbert Wassy, erin rouvigne aubry petite foray Onzine, Prouvy, Belin, and Vavrechain. As on the previous day, all these villages contained civilians, who subsequently suffered considerably from deliberate hostile shelling. 
the first canadian division had now been in the line for two weeks without having an opportunity to rest and refit since the hard-fought battle of the canal du nord and orders were issued for its relief by the third canadian division at dawn on october twenty two in order that touch with the enemy be maintained the first canadian division pushed forward following closely the third canadian division passed through the first canadian division during the forenoon on the left brigade front about nine a m on the line of the st armand rasmus road and on the right about noon on the line of the st armand rasmus railway the foray de vicoigne having been cleared of the enemy on relief the first canadian division came into rest billets in the saman pecancourt masny area the third and fourth canadian divisions pushed on during october twenty two and by nightfall trice saint leger la vignoble la sentinelle vas la o vauvrage Bruay, and practically the whole of the large forest of rasmus were in our hands on the left brigade front of the fourth canadian division the scheldt canal had been reached in places a very large area northeast of valenciennes and a smaller area to the southwest had been flooded and to the west of the city the canal itself provided a serious obstacle to the southwest beyond the flooded area montreuil and the famar ridge made a natural line of defense the twenty second corps on our right had been held up along the ecaillon river and the eighth corps on our left had not been able to make any considerable advance chiefly owing to supply difficulties and were still some distance behind us the divisions continued to push forward in the face of steadily increasing opposition and by october twenty five had reached the canal and the western edge of the inundated area along the whole corps front our troops had had a very arduous pursuit and the railhead for supplies and ammunition was still very far to the rear it was therefore decided that we should make good the west bank of the canal and stand fast until the flanking corps had made progress attempts to cross the canal proved that the enemy was holding in strength a naturally strong position and it was ordered that no crossing in force would be attempted without reference to corps headquarters the engineers established dumps of material well forward on selected sites so that the bridges necessary to cross the canal on the resumption of our advance could be constructed without delay a glance at the map will show that the scheldt canal after passing denain takes a turn of four or five thousand yards southeast and then at the village of Thion, on its south bank where the ecaillon river joins the canal turns again northeast to where some seven or eight thousand yards lower down it skirts the west flank of valenciennes thence it continues in a generally northeasterly direction some thirteen or fourteen thousand yards to conde which is but two or three miles from the belgian border at conde the scheldt swings off at right angles to the northwest contained within this right angle is the foray de rasmus through which our troops had penetrated they were therefore several miles beyond valenciennes on the left or north bank of the scheldt the enemy had flooded the canal from conde raising the waters not only as far as the city itself but a considerable distance west of it halfway to Thion. some of our troops of the tenth brigade of an adventurous spirit sought to enter valenciennes from the south by crossing this inundated area by boat but their craft was promptly riddled by machine-gun bullets and they had difficulty in making the shore again so far therefore as the canadian corps in its present area was concerned no attack on valenciennes was feasible many civilians were known to be still in the city and so we could not shell the enemy out 
quite apart from the desire not to damage a city still intact. On the other hand, the Bosch made full use of this immunity by establishing batteries of artillery and machine guns at every point of vantage and maintaining on our lines a continual harassing fire. It was obvious that until the Corps on our right advanced along the south bank of the Scheldt, we could only mark time. Happily, the weather had taken a turn for the better. We luxuriated in a belated Indian summer, squaw summer as they call it in the West. The Corps commander explains the situation and disposition as follows, quote, It had become apparent that unless the enemy withdrew, Valenciennes could only be taken from the south. The 22nd Corps on the right had meanwhile succeeded in crossing the Echeon River after a hard fight and captured the Famar Ridge. They had, however, been unable to take Montreuil, which commanded Valenciennes from the south. On October 27, the First Army commander outlined the plan for operations to be carried out in conjunction with attacks on a large scale by the Third and Fourth Armies to the south as follows. Item A. The capture of Montreuil and Aulnois to be carried out by the 22nd Corps on the morning of October 28. Item B. The capture of the high ground overlooking Valenciennes from the south to be carried out by the Canadian Corps on a subsequent date, probably October 30. Item C. The capture of the high ground east of Valenciennes to be carried out after item B above, probably on November 1. Valenciennes would thus be outflanked from the south. The Canadian Corps would take over probably on the night of October 28 to 29. The left brigade frontage of the 22nd Corps, parentheses approximately 2,500 yards, close parentheses, in order to carry out phase item B and item C of this operation. The above attacks were to be carried out simultaneously with the attacks of the 3rd and 4th Armies. In accordance with the above, instructions were issued to the 3rd Canadian Division to take over the frontage of the left brigade of the 4th Canadian Division. The 4th Canadian Division was, in turn, ordered to relieve the left brigade of the 22nd Corps, Parentheses, 51st Division, close parentheses. Both side slips to take place on the night of October 28 to 29, subsequent to the capture of Montreuil by the 22nd Corps. The attack of the 51st Division on Montreuil on October 28 was not successful. In the first rush, the troops succeeded in gaining a foothold on the objective but were subsequently driven out by repeated counterattacks. In view of this, the relief of the left brigade of that division by the 4th Canadian Division was postponed. During the night of October 28 to 29, however, the 3rd Canadian Division relieved the left brigade of the 4th Canadian Division. During the month of October, we had captured 2,950 prisoners. 136 guns and 467 machine guns, 42 trench mortars, 6 anti-tank rifles, 6 locomotives, and other material and rolling stock. End of Part 4, Chapter 4 Recording by James O'Connor, Randolph, Massachusetts, January 2011
and no progress was possible until an advance had been made on the city along the right bank through Main, Fama, and Aulnoy. To understand the situation, a brief description is necessary. Valenciennes lies in the valley of the Scheldt, at the junction of that river with the Rhonelle. The civic insignia representing two swans, emblematic of the two rivers. The city slopes up from the canal to heights on the east, crowned by the museum and a handsome modern water tower. Further east, beyond its outskirts, is still higher ground. We have seen how Tiant lies on the right bank of the elbow of the Scheldt, to the south where it is joined by the Ecaillon River. Two thousand yards lower along the right bank is the straggling and low-lying town of Main, and from here down to Valenciennes and thence to Conde, enemy engineers had inundated the bed of the canal to a width of a thousand yards and in certain areas a great deal more making passage by troops in face of machine-gun fire impossible parallel to the scheldt two thousand yards distance at the narrowest point the rhonelle river also flows south to valenciennes and between these two streams a tongue of high land runs from behind Mans to the southern suburbs. Two thousand yards east by north of Mans is the village of Fama, occupying high ground overlooking the Rhonelle Valley. Fifteen hundred yards further north, and about three thousand yards south of Valenciennes, is the dominating feature of Montui, whose height of eighty-three meters raises it some forty or fifty meters above the valleys on either side from this point the ridge falls down gently to valenciennes but on its southwest and west faces the hill presents sharp steep contours clothed in wood and making it very difficult to assault from that direction the approach from fama is more open and the rise less abrupt the position is one of considerable natural strength of which the enemy had made best use turning scattered farmhouses into machine-gun posts and establishing batteries along the ridge in particular the steelworks on the scheldt west and northwest of montui had been strongly fortified from these an entrenched line had been dug right athwart the ridge east and west just behind Montui, due east to connect with the village of Aulnoy, lying in the valley of the Rhonelle. Behind all was the determination of the enemy to make a definite stand in front of Valenciennes. Backed by the inundated areas of the Scheldt, he here sought to hold a pivot on which the retreat now in progress, both north and south, might be firmly based. The narrative of the First Army quoted above thus describes what was happening on our immediate right. Quote, October 25. The attack was renewed on the 22nd Corps front, and the 51st Division cleared up the ground to near the valenciennes le Quesnoir Railway. At 6 p.m., the enemy, after throwing over a great weight of high explosive and gas shells, made a counterattack. The Argyle and Sutherlands on the left, who, like the rest, had been wearing gas masks that day for hours, got up, rushed with the bayonet to meet the counterattack, drove it back, and actually advanced their position about 500 yards. During the earlier counterattacks, the enemy had lost very many men, in spite of the fact that he used low-flying planes, gunning our men to keep down their fire. The 4th British Division pushed on and took Querinay. In the afternoon, the enemy counterattacked, but fruitlessly. The Rhonelle was now immediately in front. The 22nd Corps line ran from the inundation southwest of Valenciennes in a southeasterly direction to the Bavay Road. The inundation line was turned and had advanced to the northeast with the left flank on the flooded area 
would free Valenciennes. To secure the crossing of the Ronelle, the 4th British Division successfully established a bridgehead east of the village of Atre. Preparations were now made for an attack to cross the Ronelle, take Presseau, and the heights to the immediate south of Valenciennes, while the Canadians were to attack from the west through the gaps in the flooded area. These operations would mean the restoration to France of Valenciennes, the only remaining French town of importance on the British front. It meant also that the elaborately prepared system of inundation, which the enemy had, by much destruction of valuable works, set up as a barrier, had proved futile to arrest the rapid advance of the British army. Quote, October 26, on the 22nd Corps front south of Valenciennes, the 51st Division attacked again and took Famar, a dominant hill between the canal and the aulnois famar road. Some got to Montuy, but were unable to remain. Famar's, which was full of civilians, was suffering from the enemy's high explosive and especially gas shelling. A French officer in liaison succeeded in getting a number of these civilians out, little by little. October 27, the enemy counterattacked again and got into Famar. The Gordons ejected him, retook the village, and kept it. October 28, an attack was again made on Montuy, and the sea force got through to a Bosch trench on the north of the Aulnois Poirien road. But the enemy was resolved to hold this hill, and by a strong counterattack, forced our troops back to the southwest of Wee Wood. October 28 and 29. On this night, the 49th Division began to relieve the 51st. As fighting was going on, the 6th Argyles were temporarily left with the incoming 49th and repulsed two counterattacks that morning before leaving the line, thus keeping up the unsurpassed record of the 51st for being in all the fighting and carrying success with them in all situations. No division of the entire army has done sterner, more efficient, nor more constant fighting than these glorious territorials of the north. In a direct attack over this same ground by the Canadian Corps, its long flank on the other side of the Scheldt, instead of being as hitherto a weakness, could be turned to good account, because all our batteries could be brought to play upon the high ground around Famars and Montuy, and after the miscarriage described above, the decision was reached that the 4th Canadian Division should make the attempt. The task was entrusted to the 10th Brigade, to whose command Brigadier General J. M. Ross, former commander of the 5th Brigade, but who had now returned, recovered from the wound he had received in the Amiens show, had succeeded on the appointment of Brigadier General R. J. F. Hayter, to be Brigadier General General Staff. Throughout these operations and until the last few days, the BGGS of the Canadian Corps, parentheses, who might be described as Chief of Staff, close parentheses, had been a very capable Imperial officer, Brigadier General N. W. Weber. But the latter had now rejoined the British Army. General Hayter, however, was not to be kept out of this show and during its progress he established himself at headquarters of his old brigade with General Ross at Maine. The 10th Brigade relieved the 22nd Corps in the section immediately south of the Scheldt on the night of October 29-30, the attack being set for the morning of November 1, when in conjunction the 12th Brigade and troops of the 3rd Canadian Division were to endeavor to establish crossings of the canal north of the city. Preparations for the attack are thus described by the Corps commander. Quote, Orders were received that the Canadian Corps was to carry out all three phases of the operation against Valenciennes 
in conjunction with attacks of the 22nd Corps. Accordingly, the 4th Canadian Division was ordered to relieve the left brigade of the 51st Division during the night of October 29-30 on the line then held and to be prepared to carry out the attack on the morning of November 1. In conjunction with the attack, the 3rd Canadian Division was ordered to cross the canal and the inundated area on its front and establish a bridgehead to enable the engineers to reconstruct the bridges leading into the city. In the short period available, elaborate preparations were made for the support of the attack. The position was eminently suitable for the use of enfilade as well as frontal fire, the general direction of the attack on Montui being parallel to our front, and full advantage of this was taken in arranging the artillery and machine-gun barrages. The application of heavy artillery fire was restricted because the enemy had retained many civilians in Valenciennes and the adjoining villages. Strict orders were issued that the city and villages were not to be bombarded, with the exception of a row of houses on the eastern side of the canal which were occupied by a large number of machine guns. To hinder the good observation which the enemy would otherwise have been able to enjoy from the city and village, very elaborate arrangements were made to place heavy smoke screens along certain areas. Despite great difficulties of transport, the supplies of ammunition, bridging material, etc., moved forward were sufficient and before dawn on November 1, all preparations were completed. The time for the assault was fixed for 5.15 a.m. November 1. The plan of attack was as follows. Quote, the right brigade of the 4th Canadian Division, parentheses 10th Canadian Infantry Brigade, Brigadier General J. M. Ross, close parentheses, southeast of the canal, was to carry out the attack at zero hour under a coordinated barrage in a northerly direction and capture Montui, Aulnois, and the high ground south of Valenciennes, and then to exploit the success by pushing on to the high ground east of the city. Subsequently, the troops northwest of the canal, parentheses left brigade, 4th Canadian Division, and the 3rd Canadian Division, close parentheses, were to force crossings north of the city and encircle it from that side. Zero hour was set for 5.15 a.m., and the men went into the attack in the dark, supported by a concentric barrage of great power. All the first objectives were gained by the hour set, 8 a.m., our troops being aided in their advance when dawn broke by a very efficient smoke barrage, completely obscuring the enemy's observation. The attack was made by the 44th Battalion of New Brunswick, though originally recruited at Winnipeg, on the right, with the 47th Battalion, Western Ontario, on the left. After taking Fermat, which again had fallen into enemy hands, the 44th fought their way into Aulnois where it was only after hand-to-hand -hand fighting that the enemy was overcome. The 46th Battalion, South Saskatchewan, here leapfrogged, pushing on the attack along the left bank of the Ronelle to the outskirts of Marley, a suburb on the southwest of the city, where were more steelworks stoutly defended. Meantime, on the left, the 47th had captured Montui and the trench system beyond where the 50th Battalion, Calgary, came up in support, pushing on the attack along the ridge. We encountered bitter resistance from enemy machine-gun posts, particularly from the garrison established in the Poirien farm, composed of very young troops who fought recklessly, refusing to surrender even when we were upon them with the coal, steel, and bombs. We captured here 20 machine-guns. Some other of the enemy troops were not so steadfast, a whole company surrendering, its officers saying that they had heard overnight that Austria had surrendered, and it was useless for Germany to fight longer. 
it developed that the enemy was preparing to attack that morning with three regiments and these were smothered by our barrage his losses being exceptionally heavy particularly along the ronelle valley in this very brilliant action the tenth brigade captured over one thousand eight hundred prisoners more than the entire strength of its infantry engaged and we buried eight hundred bosch on the field it was dashing work calling for individual initiative and sacrifice as the following incident will illustrate during the attack of the forty sixth battalion sergeant hugh cairns of north saskatoon found that his platoon was being exposed to the fire of a machine-gun post without a moment's hesitation he seized a lewis gun and single-handed in face of direct fire rushed the post killing the crew of five and capturing the gun later when the line was held up by machine-gun fire he again rushed forward killing twelve of the enemy and capturing eighteen with two guns still further on when the advance was held up by both field and machine-gun fire and although wounded he led a small party and outflanked the position killing many forcing about fifty to surrender and capturing all the guns not content with this after our line had been consolidated he went forward with a battle patrol to exploit marley held by the enemy in force and after a stiff fight forced sixty of the enemy to surrender whilst disarming this party he was severely wounded by fresh enemy elements nevertheless he opened fire on these and inflicted heavy losses finally he was rushed by about twenty enemy and collapsed from weakness and loss of blood throughout this operation he showed the highest degree of valor and his leadership greatly contributed to the success of the attack he died from his wounds the following day the events of this day are described in the narrative of the first army as follows quote, november one the capture of the ground south of valenciennes between the ronelle river and the scheldt canal was of extreme importance so as to compel the enemy to evacuate the town the canadian corps were holding the western approaches to the town and the western bank of the scheldt canal and their guns were able to batter the tongue of land where the fifty first division had been fighting an attack by canadian troops in a northerly direction from about Alnoy could thus be supported by their artillery fire from south west and north and offered the best and safest means of capturing valenciennes the canadian corps relieved the twenty second corps parentheses fifty first division close parentheses between the ronelle and the scheldt and attacking in conjunction with the twenty second corps parentheses and they with the third army close parentheses in extremely severe fighting took montuy and the western part of alnoy also establishing a bridgehead north of valenciennes over the inundations a large concentration of artillery was used and the enemy's losses were very heavy over eight hundred germans were counted and buried in a small part of the battlefield near alnoy on which the fire of forty-two six-inch howitzers parentheses among other calipers close parentheses was concentrated the germans resolutely fought to defend the whole position and clung with determination to the watery corner near conde but their defenses were constructed to resist attack from the west and the attack of the canadians from the south was too much for them as the northern division of the twenty second corps between the fourth canadian and fourth british divisions the forty ninth division jumped off from a line northeast of famar to halfway between famar and atra towards the ronelle this they crossed and advanced as far as the presso marley road to the marley steelworks the fighting was very severe the enemy holding strongly to their south the fourth british division crossed the river curiously enough the crossing was facilitated by the fact that the enemy had left many felled trees lying from bank to bank across which our men walked 
Some of the 4th got into Presseau, but the enemy launched a counterattack with a fresh division, and our troops were pushed out. In the afternoon, four companies of Canadians entered Valenciennes from the west. 2,750 prisoners were taken in this action. At 8 a.m., so soon as the success of the operation to the south was established, the 12th Canadian Infantry Brigade began drifting outposts across the canal into Valenciennes, establishing posts along the east side, seizing the railway and yards, and holding a line in the southern outskirts of the city up to the Place de Fama inclusive. This was a very dashing operation, and owed much of its success to the fine cooperation of Canadian engineers and artillery, gunners of the 58th CFA, wrapping the wheels of an 18-pounder in carpet, brought the gun down secretly at night into a house on the west side of the canal, just opposite an enemy machine-gun post known to command the only practical crossing. At zero hour next morning, the gun was fired through the wall at a point-blank range of only a few yards, blowing the machine guns and crews into the air. The 38th Battalion of Ottawa crossed over the locks on the southwest of the city by a footbridge under a heavy enfilading fire from machine guns and proceeded to consolidate the line of the railway. A party of our troops began working their way thence north into the old town, but just beyond the Place de Fama, a French woman ran out, waving them back. The enemy had established a battery, sweeping the boulevard with wire entanglements beyond, and but for this timely warning, the party must have been wiped out. Simultaneously, the 72nd Battalion of Vancouver effected a crossing lower down the canal, and after sharp fighting succeeded in establishing a line on the northwest outskirts of the city. Orders were given to hold the line thus won that night, the object being to save casualties and possible destruction of the city by street fighting. Early next morning, November 2, the 38th, supported on the right by troops of the 11th Brigade, who had passed through the 10th Brigade in the night, and on the left by the 72nd Battalion, passed through the city to its eastern boundary. Two Canadian gunners, with two French interpreters, at ten o'clock that morning, swarmed up the tower of the Hotel de Ville, cut down the German standard, and hoisted the tricolor. Valenciennes was ours, but the enemy still clung tenaciously to the ridge immediately east of the city. We attacked in force again, and drove him out of the strong positions he held between saint Salva and the Chateau Uris. On our right, the 22nd Corps, after being checked at noon on November 1 by determined counterattacks, had pushed on and established contact with us at Marley. Further down the canal, troops of the 3rd Canadian Division, ably supported by Canadian engineers, had succeeded in consolidating a bridgehead north of the city. Sir Arthur Curry's account of this day's fighting is as follows, quote, At 5.15 a.m., November 1, the attack was launched, and from the first went entirely according to plan on the Canadian Corps front. The enemy barrage dropped quickly and was very heavy, but shortly afterwards slackened down under the influence of our effective counter-battery fire. In the meantime, the attacking infantry got well away advancing under a most excellent barrage, and reached their objective, the line of the valenciennes Mauberge Railway, on time right behind the barrage. The fighting during the advance was heavy, especially around the houses along the famas valenciennes Road and in Alnois. The thoroughness of the preparations made for this small but important battle is better illustrated by the following striking figures. Number of enemy dead buried, over 800. Prisoners captured, over 1,800. Parentheses exceeding the number of assaulting troops, close parentheses. Our casualties, approximately 80 killed and 300 wounded. 
On the left, the left brigade of the 4th Canadian Division and the 3rd Canadian Division had, in the meantime, succeeded in crossing the canal. Bridgeheads were established north of the city, the station and railway yards were seized, and the engineers commenced the construction of bridges. The enemy did not counterattack against the Canadian Corps during the day, but continued to hold out strongly in the southern outskirts of Valenciennes and Marly, and in the steelworks to the southeast until dark. Two counterattacks against the 22nd Corps front on the right caused some anxiety, but that flank was strengthened and no trouble developed. During the night, the 4th Canadian Division took over an additional brigade frontage from the 49th Division, 22nd Corps, on the right preparatory to the capture of the high ground east of Marley. Patrols of the 4th Canadian Division pushed forward during the night and ascertained that the enemy was withdrawing. In the early morning, our troops had completely cleared Valenciennes and Marley, and patrols had entered San Salva. End of Part 4, Chapter 5 Recording by James O'Connor, Randolph, Massachusetts, November 2010Part 4, Chapter 6 of Canada's Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesay. Part 4, Chapter 6. Welcome to the Deliverer. On the morning of October 2, the civil authorities transmitted the following message through Canadian Corps signals to the French government. Quote, After 50 months of hard captivity, but always resolute and inspired by the memory of her sons heroically fallen on the field of honor, the city of Valenciennes, cruelly separated from her brave mayor, Dr. Truchon, and with a great number of her inhabitants in exile, addresses to the French government the expression of her admiration for the victorious armies of the Entente and her patriotic cry of joy on the day of her deliverance. Quote. Dr. Truchon had persistently opposed the exactions of the German military governor until finally he was exiled. Acting in his place remained Messieurs Billier and Damien, who, together with Monsieur René Delame, representative of the American Relief Committee, administered faithfully to the wants of their people, and were not to be deterred by threats and commands from doing what was possible to mitigate their unhappy condition, for their lot was very miserable. Except for a little meal, these depended entirely on American and Spanish relief for their food, and the one bright spot in a story of oppression and violence is the figure of a German, Rittmeister Winnerborg, associated with Monsieur Delam in the relief, who did his best to see that it was honestly distributed. The normal population of Valenciennes is about 35,000, and on October 13, the entire population was evacuated by order, the movement continuing for a fortnight until on our entry only 4,500 of the original inhabitants were left, many being too sick to move. About 25,000 people remained in the city, but most of these were from Cambrai, whence 50,000 evacuees had passed through Valenciennes making the long journey on foot, the movement starting so soon as the advance of the Canadian Corps over the Canal du Nord developed. These poor folk passed through Valenciennes to Mons and Maubeuge at the rate of about 5,000 a day, and added immensely to the difficulties of rationing the civil population. Many were so exhausted they could not continue their flight. On the morning of November 1, when the battle opened, the entire civilian population was paraded in the Place d'Armes, 
and ordered to evacuate immediately. Soon the roads leading east were hopelessly choked and the movement was stopped. That day there was great running to and fro by the garrison, and at night the enemy marched out. As they left, they cut the water supply, destroyed the reservoirs, and blew up the powerhouse supplying the city with electric light. Hardly were they clear of the town, hitherto undamaged, than they turned their batteries upon it, doing some damage in the Place d'Armes and to the east end of the cathedral, raining down phosphor shells with the intention of setting the city afire. Only the prompt entry of our troops and the vigorous offensive we pushed out both north and east saved the city. Our troops were rapturously received. The enemy had filled the city with gas, and women and children, their eyes red-rimmed and streaming, pressed upon them, embracing, quote, Les braves Canadiens, end quote. From out their slender store they produced hot coffee and a curious substance made from coarse meal, known to them as bread. Called together by the two acting mayors, the city council promptly adopted resolutions, thanking their deliverers and renaming the Place de Famars, where we had first entered, the Place du Canada, with the promise that a worthy monument would be erected in that spacious square to the Canadian soldiers fallen in battle. In contrast to Cambrai and Douai, no systematic sack had taken place here, but individual soldiers had looted at will. All the works of art had been removed from the art gallery and the museum, where still were a number of statues packed ready for shipment. The enemy exactions throughout these had been very severe and even meticulous. Thus an old lady had twenty-three hens, she was ordered to supply fifteen eggs a day or pay a mark for each egg short. The hens went broody, and in despair of the daily drain upon her purse, she killed the hens and sent them in a basket to the Herr Commandant. She was fined ten thousand marks. One comes back again and again to the contemplation of the French people of the evacuated areas. They are everywhere on the roads, in the villages, bearing without complaint nor heroics their heavy burden, hiding in their hearts their sorrows that they may turn a joyous face to the deliverer. Of all the deep-bitten impressions one must carry away, none is so indelible as that of this patient endurance, the fine quiet courage and elasticity of spirit that may bend but not break wherein lies the secret of the mute but unshaken fortitude that suffers adversity, hunger, cold, jeers and insults of the invader, loss of household goods, loss, too, of husband, brother, and ailing child, but does not despair. Their intense patriotism carries them through. Self is immolated in the state. One asks oneself, having lost all, what remains? There remains France, and the promise of the generations to come. For the rest there is the comfortable spectacle of the beaten enemy. One dwells on these people released from their captivity, because it is for that our men have suffered and endured. Here are the ripe fruits of their sacrifice. In their youth they were consecrated to this brave purpose. Its attainment ennobles their arms, sets a crown upon their staunch array. It is not for a little thing they have fought and died. Out of all the materialism of war, there emerges again the high idealism that set their feet along that bitter road. They are all but inarticulate, these peasants. It is difficult to enlist their interest in the recital of their experiences they would sooner forget. They take it all as a matter of course, for the man a soldier's grave, for the woman unwept tears. Such is war to the French nation. Little is left of, quote, la gloire, end quote. And now that tardy victory breaks through the gloom. They trudge patiently back to their desolated hearths. One wonders if they can ever regain their traditional gaiety 
or is it not a myth built up around the artificial life of paris the old people are very old the young wan one of the mayors of valenciennes a highly educated man sought to explain his state of mind Quote, you must pardon me he said i am not able to express myself clearly for so long speech was repressed and one was permitted only to answer questions End quote. We are caught in a block of traffic. It is a one-track road, and as we wait, an endless procession goes by of marching men, lorries and wagons, and limbers and guns. It is such a rare day as one encounters on the prairie in October, when the unexpected warmth of the sun dispels the mists of a frosty night, and the sky is blue and still but here in this sad land of france the earth is green with sprouting grain and russet and gold still canopy the woods from either direction little groups of peasants seek their homes old men yoked to high two-wheeled hand-carts with women pushing behind or carrying nothing more than bundles tied and ticking our soldiers pick up the children an old woman and her grandchild are passing from man to famars and she tells her pitiable story they had had the good fortune to remain in their home in famars undisturbed the grandfather almost decrepit british troops captured the village and they were freed but the enemy was throwing in gas shells and it was ordered the villagers must go back behind our lines the old man remained to guard his little property by an ironic turn of fate the enemy recaptured the village and removed all left behind with their goods and chattels Quote, why did they not leave me with my man she asked i am an old woman and have not long to live it is better to die of the gas than return to nothing End quote. there was the baffling mystery of why these people passed in opposite directions in all sorts of cross directions from Denain they were returning to Valenciennes, and from Valenciennes to Denain, while in both were many people from far Cambrai. And here is the most brutal feature of the Bosch policy. They deliberately transferred villages, tearing asunder the countryside, that they might more easily control these destitutes set in strange places. The young men to work in the trenches and the young women in munition factories or worse the village cleared there followed the systematic sack contents of value loaded on to government trains the rest given to the men and into this ruin other villages were transferred presently we are in famars a long queue stretches back of the church within monsieur le maire is distributing the iron rations provided by the british army one by one the villagers pass in and get their bully beef, biscuit, tea, sugar, pepper, and salt. In another corner the wants of the sick and of the very poor are looked after by an energetic officer of the Canadian Red Cross. Soup, cocoa, and the like, gift of the people of Canada. Shells have struck that church. Four times it has changed hands. Underfoot is a litter of plaster and straw where German soldiers have been billeted. On the walls the stations of the cross are shattered or awry. But what fitter use for a church? Monsieur le Curé is all smiles. A woman, babe in arms, comes forward. On her face the resignation, the pity of the Madonna. These are the commonplaces of evacuated France. Terrible stories might be recounted, heroic episodes where the brutal fury of the invader has been defied to the end, but they are not needed to illustrate the splendor that emerges from the fundamental misery, the splendor of these patient people of France. The whole country east of us is bisected with little rivers running through swamps and irrigation ditches. On our left front this has all been flooded, and the going is very difficult for troops of our third division the enemy has improvised a line of rifle pits linking up the fosses of slag each of these a miniature fortress everything now depends on the work of the canadian engineers 
supported by our railway troops and labor battalions. These push on indefatigably, often under fire, and in a remarkably short time succeed in restoring communications in a country where the enemy has blown every bridge and causeway and even every length of steel. By evening of November 5, our line, with the 11th Brigade on the right, the 12th Brigade in the center, and the 8th Brigade on the left, covering a battlefront of about 12,000 yards, extended from the east of the Aunel River between Marchepont and Angra, thence east of Quarouble, through Vic and across the flooded area to where two miles south of Conde, the 3rd Canadian Division had bridged the Scheldt. The Onel, a tributary of the Grand Onel, which it joins a little further north, is at this point the boundary between France and Belgium, and on the night of November 5 to 6, the 87th Battalion, Montreal Grenadier Guards, were the first Canadian troops to bivouac on Belgian soil since we had left the Ypres salient after having crossed the river during the day by a brilliant maneuver. The following morning, November 6, the 102nd Battalion on our right passed through the 87th and captured Bazieux. On our left, the 8th Brigade, compromised of CMR battalions, after heavy fighting over the only practical causeways through swamps and marshes, captured Crespin and then made a dashing attack on the strongly held line of the Honneau River, effecting a crossing on the extreme left thus turning the enemy's positions. The 12th Brigade, meanwhile, had established itself in the southern outskirts of the French town of Quivrechain, and now, in conjunction with the 8th Brigade, completed its capture and crossed the Arnel into Belgian territory, the enemy having failed to blow the bridge at this point. By night we held the western outskirts of Quivrechain on the Mons Road. 500 prisoners were captured. On the night of November 6 to 7, the 2nd Canadian Division completed relief of the 4th Canadian Division, which had been in the thick of all the fighting since September 27, and now went into rest. We were now entering a thickly populated coal mining country where the industrial villages melt one into another practically all the way to Mont. The enemy was fighting a delaying action to enable him to evacuate his material. Faces of our weary, mud-stained men who all day had toiled after the retreating Bosch light up at the news that comes over the French wireless that German envoys are on French soil, suppliants for peace. About this time, Le Petit Parisien publishes an article entitled, quote, The Canadians in the Great War, end of quote. After quoting from the recent exchange of messages between Premier Sir Robert Borden and Sir Arthur Curry, on the occasion of the anniversary of the arrival of the Canadian First Contingent in France, the article continues as follows, quote, The message of General Curry goes a great way beyond the usual scope of such manifestos. One cannot read it without profound emotion. So sternly grand are the sentiments he expresses. In the midst of the rumors and the agitation created by the enemy peace offensive, the authoritative voice of the great Canadian general is lifted clear, vigorous, and sincere. End quote. After quoting from the message the passage wherein the Corps commander enumerates the necessity of complete victory if peace is to be permanently restored, and declares that the Canadian did demand nothing less, the journal concludes, quote, The generous and sublime prayer of those who perhaps are to die in the battle of tomorrow has been widely heard. Our own armies, bound to silence, will read with gratitude this message of General Curry, for it reflects admirably all that lies repressed in the soul of our heroic soldiers. End quote. The Corps commander sums up the operations of this period as follows. Quote, the advance was continued in the face of stubborn resistance from enemy rear guards throughout November 2 on the whole Corps front, 
and by nightfall had reached the line marly saint solve bazamare rocour chateau all inclusive on the front of the third canadian division the advance was particularly difficult the country being under water except where railway embankments slag heaps and houses stood up out of the flood and afforded excellent cover for enemy machine gunners and riflemen some stiff fighting took place when the advance was continued on november three but in spite of this good progress was made especially on the right on the front of the eleventh canadian infantry brigade brigadier general v w odlam where the line was advanced three thousand yards and the village of Estro captured progress on the left was necessarily slower owing to the flooded nature of the ground the front of the third canadian division had now become very extended and on the night of november three to four a portion of it from Odome to fresnes about a mile in extent was handed over to the fifty second division of the eighth corps on november four the line was carried forward about two miles on the front of the fourth canadian division the village of onay and the western part of rombes fell into our hands after severe fighting the third canadian division was still forcing its way through martian water and made good the vic diaz railway on the extreme left of the third canadian division a strong point east of the scheldt canal was captured and the escopont quivrechain railway bridge was taken during the early hours of november five the third canadian division entered the town of vic following the capture of two points of local tactical importance west of the town a large portion of the line of the escopon ivrechin railway was also made good and the northern part of quarobla captured during the day the fourth canadian division attacked on november five and clearing rombes and the southern part of quarobla crossed the river onel between rombes and marchepont the enemy fighting very stubbornly to prevent our crossing by this advance the first troops of the canadian corps crossed into belgian territory the onel river being the boundary at that point the advance was resumed on november six and important progress made the villages of marchepont bazieux and the southern portion of quivrechon were taken by the fourth canadian division while the third canadian division took the railway station and glassworks at quivrechon and the northern part of the village and also captured crespin further north the enemy's resistance was very stubborn the twenty second corps on the right were forced to give up a portion of the ground gained and to withdraw to the west bank of Fonel river at angre in the face of severe counter-attacks the second canadian division relieved the fourth canadian division during the night of november six to seven and the latter was withdrawn to rest in the anzon aubry area just west of valenciennes on our right we were now getting into the heart of the belgian coal district a thickly populated area where the numerous towns and villages the coal mines and the commanding slag heaps complicated the task the second and third canadian divisions attacked on the morning of november seventh and although by this time the weather had broken and the country was rapidly becoming thoroughly waterlogged good progress was made during the day the enemy showing increasing signs of demoralization the second canadian division on the right captured the sugar refinery northeast of bazieux the town of eluge and the many small settlements that surrounded it in conjunction with the third canadian division quivrain was taken and an advance of about two and a half miles made on the left the third canadian division in addition to cooperating with the second canadian division in the capture of quivrain pushed along the mons road for about four thousand yards and took la croix and Ancise north of the road the eighth corps on our left had still been unable to negotiate the scheldt canal in order to better protect our rapidly lengthening left flank the third canadian division was ordered to extend its attacks to the north and in addition to clearing the country south of the conde mont canal to secure the crossings of the canal End of part four chapter six recording by james o'connor 
Randolph, Massachusetts, October 2010. Part 4, Chapter 7 of Canada's Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesay. Part 4, Chapter 7. Capture of Mons. The pursuit was continued on November 8 and 9 and carried on throughout the day at great speed, the enemy being pushed through the industrial area with no time to make a definite stand. Prisoners said they no longer had any stomach for fight. Discipline had broken down and for a month past there had been no saluting of officers. Officers accustomed to brutally ill-treat their men now walked in fear of a bayonet thrust through the back. Revolution was in the air. Nevertheless, the enemy screen of machine gunners still fought stoutly. The second Canadian division was now on our right, south of the Mons Road, and the third Canadian division working along that road and north to the Condé Canal. That famous cavalry regiment, the 5th Lancers, had come temporarily under the corps command and together with the corps cavalry did invaluable work scouting along our flank the second canadian division had been at rest since october nineteen and its units were now to make perhaps the greatest advance in point of speed ever made by a fighting unit on the west front thus the fourth brigade was in billets at Arniche on november one its battalions busily engaged in deciding their sporting championships. On November 4, the entire brigade was transferred by bus from Aniche to the aubry onin area, whence the men marched on November 6 to saint Salve, taking part with the rest of the division in the relief of the 4th Canadian Division. From Aniche via Valenciennes to Mons is a fine week's trip to say nothing of the fighting, and the men were properly tired when the goal was reached. Part of the route was by road, but much of it was across country, top boot deep in mud and slush. Always the roads were torn with shell holes and freshly exploded mines, every crossroad presenting an enormous crater, hampering the troops as well as transport. On November 7, the 4th Brigade moved to the Quiverin Marchipont area and the following day pressed on to the Eluge area, catching up to the 5th Brigade and racing after the retiring enemy. Both the 5th and 6th Brigades had had hard fighting through the industrial district, which, with its network of railways and villages, offered fine ground for defense. On November 9, the important industrial center of Wasmus Paturage was freed, together with 30,000 civilians. The 4th Brigade, with the 18th Battalion, Western Ontario, on the right, and the 21st Battalion, Eastern Ontario, on the left, passed through the 5th Brigade and pushed on to the capture of Sipli, 3,500 yards due south of Mons. Meantime, on the left, the 3rd Canadian Division, with the 7th Brigade in line, had pushed forward along the Mons Road and, further north, had crossed the Condé Canal over a bridgehead established during the night, bringing the line on the evening of November 9 to east of Flinou and Germap, the latter village being 3,000 yards due west of Mons while further north we had captured saint Gislain and pushed out patrols towards the Bois de Gilin, northwest of Mons, the Princess Patricia's being on the right and 49th Battalion of Edmonton on the left. Hard fighting took place all along the line next day, Saturday, November 10, 
During the night the enemy had moved back his guns east of Mons, but kept up a heavy fire from the hills to the east of the city, and maintained from bois le haut just east of Yon, a harassing machine-gun fire. On our right, the 4th Brigade attacked, with the 20th Battalion on the right and 19th Battalion on the left, both central Ontario. The enemy fought with the greatest tenacity, to give himself time, no doubt, to evacuate his material, and small progress was made. The 19th in particular suffered severely, losing four officers killed and fifty-three other ranks killed and wounded. In the afternoon the enemy massed for a counterattack, but this was broken up by our artillery. Troops of this brigade kept pushing forward during the evening and night, and by two o'clock next morning, November 11, the 19th Battalion had fought its way through Hion towards the mons saint symphorien road where supported by the twentieth on their right they established a line thus outflanking mons from the east at ten minutes past seven this morning brigade headquarters received the following message Quote, hostilities will cease at eleven a m november eleven troops will stand fast on the line reached at that time which will be reported to divisional headquarters immediately. Defensive precautions will be maintained. There will be no intercourse with the enemy of any description. Quote. Meanwhile, quite a stiff opposition had faced the 7th Brigade. On the brigade right, the Princess Patricia's light infantry had pushed forward on the evening of November 9 into Quesmes which lies just across the canal from Mons on the southwest. Working their way through the village, party surprised and rushed an enemy outpost 200 yards from the city limit, capturing three prisoners. Under cover of darkness, this patrol advanced up the bank of the canal where the enemy post could be heard talking. A skirmish ensued with an enemy party, but our men made good their retreat taking with them two more prisoners. In retaliation, the Bosch attempted to rush this post no less than four times before midnight, bringing up a machine gun. On the following day, November 10, the 42nd Battalion relieved the PPLI on the outskirts of Mons, while on the brigade left, the Royal Canadian Regiment came up, captured the strongly held village of Gilin, and working round the northwest of the city, established a post on the canal. That afternoon, the enemy laid down a heavy bombardment, under cover of which he began his retirement to a new line on the high ground east of Mons. Both the 42nd and Royal Canadian Regiment threw out patrols, who so soon as night fell, began working their way into the city. The enemy completed his evacuation before midnight of November 10 to 11, and we followed him closely into the town. Soon every civilian was out of bed, and when by three o'clock in the morning the city was reported clear, a scene of rejoicing began which continued throughout the day, a great reception being given our troops. A Canadian soldier who took part in the operation thus describes his impressions. Quote, the patrols reported back to their various headquarters that the enemy was established in a defense line five or six kilometers east of Mons itself, and that he was very nervous, firing his machine guns off in bursts and sending many flares up. Nothing further was done that night, there being no necessity to keep up with him at this stage of the advance. Outposts were kept up, however, and reliefs changed at usual intervals. The morning of November 11 dawned like any other day of that time of the year, a dull, dreary, bleak-looking sky overhead and a mist hanging low over the ground. The outposts had been shivering through the cold early hours of the morning with no knowledge of any such thing as an armistice 
in their minds. Those that had slept relieved the night watchers and made note of the unusual quietness that pervaded the air, putting it down to one of the peculiarities of the day. Towards seven o'clock, the usual time for the day's advance to commence, a strange rumor ran through the ranks. No advance today. What is the matter? Everybody queries. Something is wrong. Taint right, was the only answer available. The morning gradually brightened, and with it came a little word called armistice, which everybody was doubtful about. But not a single soul let up on the purpose he was there for. Steel helmets were still worn, and gas masks carried at the alert, ready for anything the enemy might attempt to pull off. Rifles and revolvers were cleaned, ready for future use, if need be. The posts were still on the job, peering into the morning mist for signs of activity on part of the Bosch, and performing their regular reliefs as though he was a matter of yards away. The artillery in the road was packing up, preparing for another advance. The usual morning's activities were noticed everywhere. Because rumors of an armistice were in the air, it did not mean that it was permissible to show signs of slackness. Everything went on as usual until official word came over the wire. Then, instead of going wild with joy, as some people will have it, a pronounced glow of satisfaction shone on the faces of all as though someone had told them the job had been well done and handshakes all around with words of encouragement mixed with thumps on the back were the only visible signs of joy of cheers there were but few the mind not being able to fully realize what armistice meant the subject was too big for them to grapple offhand and realize that no more would they have to dodge shells bullets bombs and other war paraphernalia which the Hun was in the habit of throwing around, much to the troops' discomfort. No more would they have to strain their nerves to hold their ground, while the drone of an enemy plane passed over their heads in the dark, dropping his bombs indiscriminately over the ground. End quote. Sir Arthur Curry describes these events as follows. Quote, when the advance was continued on November 8th, the 3rd Canadian Division pushed troops to the north and by noon had secured the villages of Tivoncel and saint Hébert. Later in the day, a footbridge was constructed across the Condé Mons Canal and under cover of darkness, patrols crossed and a bridgehead was established. Further south, the 3rd Canadian Division had surprised the enemy in the villages of montreuil sur anne and Thulin at an early hour, and these towns were quickly captured. Pushing on from here, the village of Hamin was taken, and by nightfall our troops were on the western outskirts of Bossu. The 2nd Canadian Division met with strong opposition. Good progress was, however, made, and by nightfall the important village of Dour and the smaller villages of Bois de Beausseau, Petit Ornou, Bois de Epinois, and a portion of the Bois de l'Eveque were cleared. Resuming the advance on November 9, the 2nd Canadian Division captured Wakini, Champ de Say, Petit Vasmus, Vasmus Paturage, La Bouverie, Lugy, Framery, and jean with little opposition. The advance made by this division was over four miles through densely populated areas, the twin towns of Vasmus Paturage combined, having a population of about 30,000. By nightfall, the 2nd Canadian Division was clear of the main mining district. The 3rd Canadian Division had on its left front crossed the river Aisne during the night, north of Montreuil sur Aisne and later secured a foothold on the north bank of the Condé Mons Canal near Le Petit Crepin. During the afternoon, further troops were sent across the canal 
and the villages of petit trepin ville pomeroy otrage and tert were taken further west the patrols which had crossed the canal on the previous day entered pomeroy and bernissart the third canadian division had also occupied bossu on its right before daylight on the ninth and rapid progress eastward was made during the day towards mons the villages of Questmas, Jemap, Flinou, Ornu, Vasmus, Carigon, Vasmuel, and Saint Gislain all being captured. The rapidity of our advance had evidently surprised and disorganized the enemy, although some opposition was met. By the morning of November 10, the 52nd Division, 8th Corps, had advanced and relieved the part of the 3rd Canadian Division operating north of the left boundary of the Canadian Corps. The 3rd Canadian Division's advance on November 10 brought our troops to the southwestern outskirts of Mons, while the 2nd Canadian Division had reached the Mons-Givry Road, outflanking the city from the south, but owing to the large number of civilians still in the city, it was not possible for us to bombard the town. To the north of the Condé Mons Canal, a further advance was made, and the village and fosse of Gilin secured. During the night of November 10 to 11, the divisions resumed their advance, and immediately after dark, the troops of the 7th Canadian Infantry Brigade, Brigadier General J. A. Clark, commenced to close in. The villages of Nimi and Petit Nimi were quickly captured and an entry into Mons by way of the railway station was effected before midnight. By 6 a.m. on November 11, the stubborn machine gun resistance had been broken and the town cleared of the enemy. The 2nd Canadian Division had during the night taken the bois le haut a wood crowning a large hill on the southeastern outskirts of Mons, thus securing the right flank of the 3rd Canadian Division. The capture of this high ground forced upon the enemy a further retirement, and our troops, still pressing on, reached and captured saint symphorien and faubourg Barthelme by 8 a.m. In the meantime, word had been received through 1st Army that hostilities would cease at 11 a.m. on November 11, the armistice having been signed in acceptance of our terms. To secure a satisfactory line for the defense of Mons, our line was further advanced, and the Bois de Havre, Bois de Rapois, and the town and villages of Havre, Bon Boulois, La Bruyere, Mazieres, Saint Denis, and Aubourg were captured before hostilities ceased. End quote. The Grand Place of Mons is thronged. Here at eleven o'clock, the zero hour of peace, as the ceasefire sounds, the mayor presents to Brigadier General J. A. Clark of the Seventh Canadian Infantry Brigade the keys of the city in honor of its recapture this morning by units of that brigade. Bands play La Brabancon, Belgium's national anthem, and O Canada. Pipers of the 42nd Battalion of Montreal lead the march past, because it was the good fortune of that unit to first enter the city. This is the 5th Royal Highlanders of Canada, affiliated with the famous Black Watch, both privileged to wear the Hackle Highland Scarlet and it is a noteworthy coincidence that the parent unit, 42nd Battalion of the British Army, was the first to leave England on August 12, 1914, and the last infantry unit to retire from Mons. By another happy good fortune, the British Field Battery, last to leave Mons on August 23, 1914, took part in this attack, and actually finished in the identical battery position whence it had retired in 1914. One other coincidence is tragic in character. The first shot fired at Mons in 1914 was by the 5th Lancers, 
now attached to the Canadian Corps, and an officer who fought here then was killed an hour and a half before the armistice. Many things have happened in those four years, from Mons to the Marne and back again, not the least significant being the Brotherhood in Arms of the Canadian Corps and the British Army. Shortly after noon, the streets are placarded with a proclamation, quote, To the people of Mons, signed by the College of the Burgomaster and Aldermen, by Monsieur Jean Lecart, Pougeance Masson, Léon Salve, Victor Mastreau, and Henri Roland, and countersigned by the Secretary of the Commune, Monsieur Gaston Taloup. It runs as follows, quote, After fifty-one months of suffering caused by the iniquitous, the pitiless, and insolent occupation of the German army, the city of Mons is at length delivered by the heroism of the British army which at the hour of the armistice completes its series of victories in the identical place where, on August 23, 1914, it first engaged the enemy. The 3rd Canadian Division, at cost of heavy sacrifices, entered the city at 3 o'clock this morning, thus avenging by a striking success the retreat of 1914. Honor and thanks be to it. The armistice is signed. The German army has capitulated. Brutal force is destroyed. Justice and right triumph. Belgium is strengthened and fortified by the terrible ordeal she has passed through. Our people have supported with dignity and courage the sufferings of the occupation. We are convinced that in this hour of joy and triumph they will observe a like restraint and self-command. We depend on the good will of all to maintain order. We also ask our people to return as soon as possible to work. Losses inflicted on us by the war are great, and the cooperation of all our good will, all our energy, is necessary to heal over quickly the wounds it has caused. In this solemn hour, our infinite gratitude goes to the Allied armies, and among them, from the bottom of our heart, to our valiant Belgian army, and to the king, its heroic chief. Long live the king, long live the Belgian nation. End quote. Such was the dramatic end to the work of the Canadian Corps in the Hundred Days, from Amiens, along the Rouai Road, then from Arras, through the Drocourt-Quillant line, to the Canal du Nord, across the Canal du Nord, over the hard field of Cambrai, and so through Dinan and Valenciennes to Mons. The final operation is thus described in the narrative of the First Army. Quote, November 11. During this day, the 2nd Canadian Division had gained the high ground south and east of Mons, and were forcing the Germans to withdraw. At dawn on November 11, the 3rd Canadian Division entered the town and a line was established east of it. Fighting had been carried on all that night and dead Germans still lay in the streets and were kicked by the inhabitants as they lay, while the carillon of the belfry played Tipperary, the players having silently practiced the tune in anticipation of the British arrival. The last round fired by the Canadian artillery, had shot off the arm of a German staff officer in a headquarters chateau by Hill 85 to the east of Mons. Early on November 11, Canadian Corps headquarters were established in the Grand Place at Mons, and the first message there received was to the effect that the armistice was signed and that hostilities were to cease at 11 o'clock. Sir Douglas Haig's last communique stated, Canadian troops of the First Army have captured Mons. End of Part 4, Chapter 7 Recording by James O'Connor Randolph, Massachusetts, October 2010
Part Four, Chapter Eight of Canada's Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesay. Part Four, Chapter Eight. Le Mans Road. On the morning of Sunday, November 10, the President of the French Republic makes his official entry into Valenciennes. A dais has been erected in front of the fine old Hotel de Ville facing the great square of the Place d'Armes, and here come little girls, bedecked in white, carrying bouquets of flowers. Here, too, gather a galaxy of military notables, army and corps commanders, our good neighbors come to pay their tribute, and outstanding among them is Sir Arthur Curry and his staff, including the Prince of Wales and Prince Arthur of Connaught. The President replies in eloquent terms to the address of welcome of the civic authorities, after eulogizing the stout heart of its people through the long years of captivity, Monsieur Poincare goes on to congratulate the Canadian Corps on its successful efforts resulting in the liberation of the city. It is with special pleasure he has heard that Valenciennes had been delivered from the enemy by the Canadians. They are very close to France. Once a daughter of France, Canada has become one of the great British dominions, but she has preserved the ideals dear to both nations. She has never forgotten France, and today forms a link binding together France and the British Empire. When the war began, the President points out Canada was first of the Dominions to pledge her aid. She has never turned back, and ever since Canadians have shed their blood freely for freedom and for France. Proud today must be the mothers of Canada in the conspicuous share of their sons in bringing the enemy to defeat and disaster. When the war is over and France restored to prosperity and happiness, she will never forget Canada and her gallant soldiers. He concluded by announcing a gift of money from the Canadian Red Cross to the stricken people of Valenciennes. Driving up and down these roads, threading our way through the thousands of refugees returning to their homes, Perhaps no cry is more common, more spontaneous, and sincere than Vive les braves Canadiens. It is a cry that comes from the heart. The Mons Road, what tragic significance lies in those three words, pictures they present of those glorious days of August 1914 when the flower of the British Army threw itself in the path of the invader, halted there the wheel of his victorious chariot, and afforded France a breathing space to make ready for the Battle of the Marne. For four years these cobbled pavements ring to the hoof of the conqueror, for him it is the road to Paris, and then August 1918 issues in a change, a cold blast from the direction of Amiens, the tide of traffic sets in the reverse direction. Back with all their impedimenta of war come those discomfited legions. Back too with them, brittle thread woven into their iron texture, come the French people of the evacuated areas. The Mons Road, clogged with sweating horses and cursing men, is filled to overflowing with the flotsam of deserted villages. Many of these poor weaklings are crowded into the ditches and there die helpless witness of these horrors was the good cure of quivrechain fourteen thousand people its entire population were evacuated from the industrial town of anzin alone he tells us and ordered to march on foot seventy kilometers to mons even as they passed him their journey hardly started twenty died one woman pushed her cart whereon lay the body of her husband. 
in a ditch a baby lived upon the breast of its dead mother quiverchin and quiverin are two villages on the road from valenciennes to mons forming indeed a continuous street divided by the bridge of the onel river a stream almost imperceptible though it be that marks nevertheless the boundary between france and belgium on the occasion one has in mind this morning of sunday november tenth nineteen eighteen the transition is sharply accentuated by national bunting quiverchan covers its wounds with the tricolor quiverin flaunts its happiness in black yellow and red that description is just for this trifling stream not only marks the boundary of two states but is the rubicon of hun hate for stricken france not river nor bunting are needed to advise the traveller he is passing from france into belgium quiverchin is a ruin quiverin inviolate back to their desolated hearth struggle the evacuated french the belge of mons a more happy fate have been left undisturbed in their bright homes theirs has been the travail of the spirit but not of the body in a short mile one passes from a ruined french ironworks to a humming belgian factory he confiscated the output of the french coal mines and destroyed them as he retired in mons he paid a good price for twelve per cent of the output and left the plant intact it is true that he stripped thousands of belgian factories and took their machinery to the fatherland but except in scattered cases there is here but little wanton destruction no deliberate ruin of the countryside to return to our road the day is misty but from jemap one can make out the great belfry of mons we walk forward shells are falling in the lower slopes of the village Groups of frantic peasants run from their houses up steep alleys to the Mons Road. There is a roar and a crash, and a lorry is engulfed in the smoke of the explosion. Swaying a little, it dashes on its way, but it has knocked down a civilian carrying a small boy, and he rushes wildly up and down, trying barred doors for shelter. The child screams pitiably. Cries and moans come from down the alley. A shell has burst among a group of civilians. Two children are dead. A woman, clutching an infant, staggers to her feet and falls again. As is often the case, this support line is a hotter zone than up forward. Up there is machine gunning and sniping. They have snipers in the belfry, but there is little shelling. It is all too close, with only the thread of the canal between the opposing lines. On right and left are great fosses of slag, pyramids of the plain. We pass villages at their door, watching the pageant of battle, careless of danger. Children run across the street of Quesmer. This is the courage of ignorance. Except for the already confused tradition of the great retreat, these people have seen nothing of war and war four years ago was in its infancy luncheon at quesmer with a battalion headquarters where the news is received with some skepticism that the armistice will be signed tomorrow morning one of them has come right through the war with his battalion rare good fortune what an experience these gallant young regimental officers daily quaff the wine of battle nor ever know what lies at the bottom of the cup there is not in the whole world a braver cleaner more inspiring society than this of the battalion they are fatalists few have expected to find themselves alive on the day of days they have seen so many comrades trusted honored and loved snatched from them in the heyday of youth and enthusiasm of honors and brave plans for the future and at any turn of the wheel up might come their number so they are not willing to believe the agony is over touch wood says one ahead the streets are deserted except under screen of buildings they are enfiladed by fire from across the canal from the o-pip of a company headquarters one has a fine view of the belfry 
the hand of the great clock points an hour ahead of our time Bosch time we pass an octroi post we are in mons ahead is a little square half a dozen enemy dead lie there the patrol overwhelmed in our rush of the previous night in the early morning they counter-attacked bringing a machine gun within twenty yards of our post so close are the lines from out of the square a broad boulevard runs down to the canal bare of all life swept by the machine guns of each side under its fine sweep of plane trees lies a tangle of trolley wires this was the last one is to see of war the short day is closing as we turn back to Jemap. in the place d'armes of valenciennes next morning massed canadian bands issue in the armistice to the strains of patriotic airs the occasion is past all demonstration our men quietly discuss the terms and the report that the canadian corps is to march to the rhine soon we are again upon the mons road with us a little priest of valenciennes a returned refugee now intent upon an errand of mercy he is delirious with joy long lines of guns transports and marching troops meet and pass the pitiable stream of evacuees to all he cries the good news calling out to soldier and civilian alike la guerre finie a onze heures this refrain he chants until he is hoarse until his voice becomes a husky joyous croak once he stops to point out new turned earth by the roadside Quote, there i helped bury a woman and her child who died upon this road End quote, he says it is with a passion of regret that we pass again the onel river behind is france and a people canadian soldiers have learned in these four years to love and revere you pass along this strip of road from france into belgium from ruin into prosperity from dire want into relative plenty valenciennes beautiful city suffered heavy requisitions its works of art looted its people evacuated it is sad today there is apathy among the remnant of citizenship but in mons it is very different so great is its place in recent history that one looks to find it scarred and war-worn it is a pleasant surprise cattle graze in the meadows french cities far removed from the battle zone can show no such bright and engaging front no shops of such abundant and tempting display nor a people as cheerful and prosperous the women are handsomely gowned and the children jolly little souls fat and rosy young men are about the boche made himself very agreeable all this was policy until the past few months the boche counted on incorporating three belgian provinces in the fatherland he played up to the people deliberately yet cajoleries failed here as completely as did intimidation and terror there the flaming loyalty of these brave walloons centering in the heroic figures of their king and queen was not to be bought by gifts nor devitalized by coddling yet under the surface there is much misery beggars haunt the streets many of the able-bodied men who refused to work in the factories for the invader were taken into germany and will never return and their families are destitute mons too has been the focus of refugees from a wide area and it is said fifty evacuees die here daily the kind belgians do everything possible but they are weakened in body and broken in spirit mons is on fete in gala attire and we might be part of a carnival show as we thread our way up the narrow street amid a populace crazed with joy they press upon our men with wine and gifts every soldier wears a red carnation stuck above his ear in the afternoon the city of mons tenders a formal reception 
to the Corps Commander and his staff. The streets are gay with bunting, black, yellow, and red predominating, though there is a fair sprinkling of the tricolor, for these loyal-hearted Walloons are French in sympathy as well as race, and all join fervently in the Marseillaise. Representative Canadian troops line the great square, the guard of honor being furnished by the fifth lancers. Replying to the address of welcome, Sir Arthur Curry says that the men of the Canadian Corps regard the occasion as a signal honor. It was on Belgian soil they had first fought in the Second Battle of Ypres, and it was fitting that they should there conclude their victorious campaign. He then presents to the city of Mons the Canadian Corps' flag, which the mayor informs him will be ever gratefully treasured in its archives. We pass on to our forward positions. It is an extraordinary experience. The front line is as silent as the grave. Our outposts stand chatting, boldly silhouetted against the skyline. No longer death screams overhead, nor speeds its whistling shaft. Our guns are shrouded in their tarpaulins, stricken dumb, and the attendant crews move about mechanically or sit and smoke their pipes, unheedful of their target. It all seems unnatural. So entirely has war become second nature. As we pass back in the darkening night over the Mons Road, lights flash out. Mons is all aglow. To walk boldly in lighted streets and recognize a passing acquaintance is a unique experience for nothing has been more depressing in those long years than this groping of one's way in the dark for fear of Heine and his bombs. These lights stand for something foreign and strange in our lives. They stand for peace. The days that follow are a tumult of sensation and emotion. Reports come from Paris and London and our Canadian cities of joyous transports and feverish demonstration. Superficially, these are signally lacking within the ranks of the Canadian Corps. Our men, still laden with their packs, tin hats, and rifles, are smiling and happy, but seemingly unelated. There has been no relaxation of that sturdy discipline which is the great strength of the Corps, nor have there been wild scenes accompanying the leaf of tension. This may be puzzling, but looking below the surface, there are good reasons why the Canadian Corps received its crowning victory as soberly as it has its successes of the past. First is the fact that it fought its way to the armistice. Canadian soldiers died in their duty within a few hours of the cessation of hostilities. On the previous day, they encountered opposition stiffer than any since the fall of Valenciennes. Bitter sad it was that these men should fall with the inn so near. But it was essential to secure so important a strategic and tactical point as Mons should the armistice proposals fall through. Even on the Sunday, few soldiers in the field believed in it, and in the London clubs, they were betting odds against it. The position of the Canadian Corps has been well put by Sir Arthur Curry. Quote, the reasons Mons was taken was that we obeyed the orders of Marshal Foch, that we should go on until we were ordered to stop. That is a thing that means much for Canada. It was a proud thing for our race that we were able to finish the war where we began it, and that we, the young whelps of the old lion, were able to take the ground lost in 1914." End quote. Then again the roadside scenes saddened their hearts. Amid that misery rejoicing has no place. Beyond these causes is the sense of responsibility. The Canadian Corps has been signally honored, and it has its own high tradition. This earnest spirit is well brought out at a dinner given at Anzin by the colonel and officers of the 54th Kootenay Battalion, to which Corps, Division, brigade, and sister battalion commanders were invited. 
Invitations had been issued before the armistice, but now the last gun had fired. A general officer present said that this was the time of test, and that the same ideals that had led the Corps to victory must inspire it now. The reputation of the Canadian Corps rested in the last analysis on the type of men in the ranks. Gaily they faced danger, and in times of stress never were such stickers. There could be no greater privilege than to lead these Canadian boys, and they could now be depended upon precisely in the same degree as in the heat of battle. A battalion commander was applauded when he said that men of the Canadian Corps must stand together in Canada, actuated by the same grave sense of responsibility they had shown in war. They would keep that good fellowship built up during the years of war and apply it to the honor and betterment of their country, and in this they would have with them the people at home, who so loyally and with such unstinted faith had supported them throughout. The silent hosts of their dead, who at Ypres and at Vimy, the Somme, Passchendaele, and since, had laid down their lives for this cause, would march with them to its fruition. Mons is an ancient city of crooked streets, winding about the hill whereon is perched the old citadel, and whence rises the venerable belfry tower. We climb aloft, up flight on flight of winding stairs, of steep ladders, past the perch of the carillon player, sweat pouring from his forehead. This enthusiast plies with racing hand and foot his multiple levers, ponderous hand-wrought iron levers, creaking primitive mechanical devices that yet for centuries have sent silver strains floating over the countryside an enthusiast indeed, and now, with music borrowed from one of our bands, pealing out Canadian national airs, and so up and up to the leaded rooftop, there to survey a far horizon. Most immediate below is a vista of roofs, roofs red and brown, covered with lichen, roofs of slate, purple and gray, roofs high-pitched and huddle, their sharp gables jutting out at all angles. So the old town, beyond are the boulevards and chateau of the rich. Due west, a thin line of flame to the sunset runs the canal de Condé. In this direction it is very flat, save for the fosses, the pyramidal slag heaps of Quesmus and Germat, etched against the glow where our men battle their way in. To the east lie hills, catching the declining rays above the darkening plain. Emerging abruptly from this flat expanse, there is something about them of mystery. They have no secret now, but standing on the belfry of Mons, one can recapture something of the dark and hidden significance that clothed their slopes in those days of August 1914. On Friday, November 15, a great military celebration is held in Mons, when a number of army chiefs are present, with the Corps Commander and the Prince of Wales. As a mark of appreciation, the city of Mons has renamed the Place de la Bavarie, where Canadian troops first entered, the Place du Canada, and a gold medal is struck and presented bearing the following inscription, quote, La Ville de Mons, for lieutenant general sir arthur w curry en souvenir de la libération de la cité par le corps canadien at a later date the king of the belgians made his state entry and congratulates sir arthur curry on the achievements of the canadian corps quote, unsurpassed by any corps in europe end quote. on the morning of sunday november seventeenth the Canadian Corps holds in the theater of Mons a service of thanksgiving to Almighty God for the blessing of victory. It is a solemn and wonderful occasion. In that hour, expression is given to all the pent-up emotions of the past weeks. The simple service, with its grave and serious note, utters aloud the deep feelings of Canadian soldiers in the hour of victory. 
fifty thousand canadians cannot take part in this service says the preacher they sleep in foreign soil but they did not die in vain we have kept the faith with them their sacrifice and that of thousands more who must return maimed and crippled have brought us to this day and they have set their true mark on the page of canadian history we thank god for these gallant men who laid down their lives and we can best requite them by carrying back with us the high ideal that has made the canadian corps a shining sword of righteousness the te deum is sung music being supplied by the band of the royal canadian regiment as the congregation files out there comes floating down from the belfry of morn a clear and sweet refrain o canada and this orchestra of silver tongues peals out across the countryside canada's message of faith and sacrifice end of part four chapter eight recording by james o'connor randolph massachusetts october two thousand ten part four chapter nine of canada's hundred days this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by james o'connor canada's hundred days by john livesay part four chapter nine into germany just a hundred days had elapsed since the canadian corps moved from arras into the amiens show up to the capture of mons in those days the corps had gone far had struck often and hard had in a dozen pitched battles met and overwhelmed the foe and proved itself in the eyes of europe and the world a weapon for the offensive of temper unsurpassed sir arthur curry thus sums up the results attained quote, between october eleven and november eleven the canadian corps had advanced to a total depth exceeding ninety one thousand yards through a country in which the enemy had destroyed railways bridges and roads and flooded large areas to further impede our progress to the normal difficulties of moving and supplying a large number of men in a comparatively restricted area were added the necessity of feeding several hundred thousand people chiefly women and children left in a starving condition by the enemy several deaths by starvation or through suffering consecutive to privation were experienced in villages and towns which being kept under hostile shell-fire and defended by machine guns could not be captured rapidly by our troops the fighting was light up to the scheldt canal but stiffened perceptibly from there on until the capture of mons and added a great deal to the physical exertion caused by such a long advance in adverse weather when it is recalled that since august eighth the canadian corps had fought battles of the first magnitude having a direct bearing on the general situation and contributing to an extent difficult to realize to the defeat of the german armies in the field this advance under most difficult conditions constitutes a decisive test of the superior energy and power of endurance of our men it is befitting that the capture of mons should close the fighting records of the canadian troops in which every battle they fought is a resplendent page of glory the canadian corps was deeply appreciative of the honor of having been selected among the first for the task of establishing and occupying the bridgeheads east of the rhine a long march of one hundred and seventy miles under difficult conditions was ahead of them but they ungrudgingly looked forward to what had always been their ultimate objective 
the occupation of german soil between november eight and november eleven the following had been captured prisoners thirty one thousand five hundred thirty seven guns heavy in field six hundred twenty three machine guns two thousand eight hundred forty two trench mortars heavy and light three hundred thirty six over five hundred square miles of territory and two hundred and twenty eight cities towns and villages had been liberated including the cities of cambrai denain valenciennes and mons from october eight to october eleven not less than forty seven german divisions had been engaged and defeated by the canadian corps that is nearly a quarter of the total german forces on the western front after october eleven the disorganization of the german troops on our front was such that it was difficult to determine with exactitude the importance of the elements of many divisions engaged i desire to record here my deep appreciation of the services of brigadier general n w weber b g g s canadian corps and of the generous efforts and untiring zeal of the general officers regimental officers the heads of all arms services and branches and the members of the various staffs until the opening of these operations vimy was properly regarded as the greatest achievement of the canadian corps and a comparison is of interest the corps always regards that battle as having begun on april ninth nineteen seventeen and finished on may five following after our troops had consolidated fresnois it was after that date that divisions began to be relieved and that lieutenant general sir julian bing issued his corps order the deepest penetration at vimy was ten thousand yards the attack being made on a front of seven thousand yards when we captured sixty-seven guns seven thousand prisoners and defeated nine german divisions but at a cost of over twenty thousand casualties in the amiens show august eighth to twenty second we attacked on a front of over eight thousand yards widening out to ten thousand yards capturing one hundred and ninety six guns nearly ten thousand prisoners and defeated sixteen enemy divisions at a cost of eleven thousand seven hundred and six casualties the arras show including the capture of the drocourt quiant line opened on august twenty sixth and concluded on september four we attacked on a front of about eight thousand yards but this was increased to twelve thousand yards as we progressed and drove a salient into the enemy defense we penetrated twenty thousand yards fought eighteen german divisions and captured ninety eight guns with about nine thousand prisoners at a cost of eight thousand nine hundred and ninety nine casualties during the hard-fought battle of cambrai we penetrated between september twenty seven and october twelve thirty thousand yards on a front of about nine thousand yards capturing over one hundred and twenty guns and between eight and nine thousand prisoners besides inflicting extremely heavy casualties on the thirteen divisions reinforced by thirteen independent machine-gun battalions the enemy brought into line against us our own casualties being fifteen thousand one hundred six in each of these three battles therefore results attained were greater than those of vimy fine victory though that was and in their cumulative effect there is of course no comparison they broke the back of enemy defense on the west front in the period august eighth to november eleven the canadian corps fired off over one quarter of all the ammunition used by all the british armies on the west front in the same period the following table of captures by british and allied armies from july eighteen to november eleven nineteen eighteen is of interest prisoners 
British armies, 188,700. French armies, 139,000. American armies, 43,300. Belgian armies, 14,500. Total prisoners, 385,500. Guns, British armies, 2,840. French armies, 1,880. American armies, 1,421. Belgian armies, 474. Total guns, 6,615. The contribution of the Canadian Corps to the British total, as stated above, but confined to the period of the Hundred Days, was 31,537 prisoners and 623 heavy and field guns, besides over 3,000 machine guns and trench mortars. These figures speak for themselves, and yet, relative to the task performed, our casualties were by no means heavy. It will be of value to record here the two appended tables. A is a summary of Canadian casualties by years, but in comparing 1916 and 1917, it is to be remembered that the 4th Canadian Division served in France less than five months in the former year. Table B is a summary of Canadian casualties by operations as from August 8 to November 11, 1918, inclusive. Table A, Summary of Canadian Casualties by Years 1915 Officers killed 121, wounded 329, missing 22. Other ranks killed 2,596, wounded 9,136, missing 1,861, total 14,065. 1916, officers killed 556, wounded 1,399, missing 115. Other ranks killed 10,183, wounded 36,339, missing 4,508, total 53,100. 1917, officers killed 610, wounded 1,779, missing 102. Other ranks, killed 11,235, wounded 44,515, missing 4,324, total 62,565. 1918, officers killed 737, wounded 2,237, missing 70. Other ranks killed 10,511, wounded 45,077, missing 1,609, total 60,241. Total killed all years, officers 2,024. Total all years wounded officers 5,744. Missing officers 309. Total all years killed other ranks 34,525. Wounded, 135,067. Missing, 12,302. Total for all officers and other ranks for all years, 189,971. Table B, Summary of Casualties, August 8 to November 11, 1918. Casualties reported from noon August 8 to noon August 26, 1918. 1st Canadian Division, officers killed 38, wounded 132, no missing. Other ranks killed 565, wounded 2,540, missing 95. Total for the 1st Canadian Division, 
3,370. Second Canadian Division. Officers killed, 30. Wounded, 107. Missing, none. Other ranks killed, 344. Wounded, 2,210. Missing, none. Total for the 2nd Canadian Division, 2,691. 3rd Canadian Division. Officers killed, 25. Wounded, 93. Missing, 5. Other ranks killed, 378. Wounded, 1,967. Missing, 118. Total for the 3rd Canadian Division, 2,586. 4th Canadian Division. Officers killed, 37. Wounded, 108. Missing, 4. Other ranks killed, 409. Wounded, 2,019. Missing, 220. Total for the 4th Canadian Division, 2,797. Canadian Corps Troops. Officers killed, 1. Wounded, 19. Missing, none. Other ranks killed, 29. Wounded, 210. Missing, 3. Total for the Canadian Corps Troops, 262. Total for all four divisions and Canadian Corps, officers killed, 139. Wounded, 459. Missing, 9. For other ranks, killed, 1,725. Wounded, 8,946. Missing, 436. Total for all four Canadian divisions and Canadian Corps troops, 11,706. Casualties reported from noon, August 26, to noon, September 5, 1918. First Canadian Division, officers killed, 33, wounded, 124, missing, 1. Other ranks killed, 217, wounded, 1,118. Missing 81. Total 1st Canadian Division, 1,574. 2nd Canadian Division. Officers killed 22. Wounded 139. Missing none. Other ranks killed 347. Wounded 2,519. Missing 440. Total 2nd Canadian Division, 3,467. 3rd Canadian Division, officers killed 30, wounded 107, missing none. Other ranks killed 342, wounded 2,118, missing 121. Total 3rd Canadian Division, 2,718. 4th Canadian Division, officers killed 26, wounded 117, missing 1. Other ranks killed 139, wounded 751, missing 37. Total 4th Canadian Division, 1,071. Canadian Corps troops, officers killed 1, wounded 13, missing none. Other ranks killed 11, wounded 142, missing 2. Total Canadian Corps troops, 169. Total for all four Canadian divisions plus Canadian Corps troops, officers killed 112, wounded 500, missing 2, other ranks killed 1,056, wounded 6,648, missing 681. Total for all four Canadian divisions plus Canadian Corps troops, 8,999. Casualties reported from noon September 5 to noon September 27, 1918. 1st Canadian Division, officers killed, 6, wounded, 20, missing, none. Other ranks killed, 356, wounded, 1,583, missing, none. Total 1st Canadian Division, 1,965. 2nd Canadian Division, Officers killed 5, wounded 37, missing 1. Other ranks killed 110, wounded 1,113, missing 3. Total 2nd Canadian Division, 1,269. 
3rd Canadian Division, officers killed 5, wounded 44, missing 1, other ranks killed 114, wounded 667, missing 19, total 3rd Canadian Division 849. 4th Canadian Division, officers killed 9, wounded 49, missing none. Other ranks killed 504, wounded 2,293, missing 74. Total 4th Canadian Division, 2,929. Canadian Corps Troops, officers killed 1, wounded 9, missing none. Other ranks killed 17, wounded 136, missing none. Total Canadian Corps Troops, 163. Total for four Canadian Divisions plus Canadian Corps Troops, officers killed 26, wounded 159, missing one. Other ranks killed 1,101, wounded 5,792, missing 96. Total for all four Canadian Divisions plus Canadian Corps Troops, 7,000. 175. Casualties reported from noon September 27 to noon October 12, 1918. 1st Canadian Division officers killed 34, wounded 189, missing 9. Other ranks killed 522, wounded 2,857, missing 521. Total, 1st Canadian Division, 4,124. 2nd Canadian Division, officers killed 16, wounded 87, missing none. Other ranks killed 155, wounded 1,103, missing 25. Total, 2nd Canadian Division, 1,386. 3rd Canadian Division, officers killed 46, wounded 141, missing 6. Other ranks killed 578, wounded 2,966, missing 347. Total 3rd Canadian Division, 4,084. 4th Canadian Division, officers killed 66, wounded 197, missing 2. Other ranks killed 647, wounded 3,880, missing 254. Total 4th Canadian Division, 5,146. Canadian Corps Troops, officers killed 4, wounded 18, missing none. Other ranks killed 42, wounded 296, missing 6. Total Canadian Corps Troops, 366. Totals for all four Canadian divisions plus Canadian Corps troops, officers killed 166, wounded 624, missing 17. Other ranks killed 1,944, wounded 11,202, missing 1,153. Total for all four Canadian divisions plus Canadian Corps troops, 15,106. Casualties reported from noon October 12 to noon November 15, 1918. First Canadian Division, officers killed six, wounded 22, missing none. Other ranks, killed 52, wounded 298, missing 51. Total First Canadian Division, 429. Second Canadian Division, officers killed 6, wounded 34, missing 2. Other ranks killed 204, wounded 1,372, missing 125. Total Second Canadian Division, 1,743. Third Canadian Division, officers killed 8, wounded 26, missing two. Other ranks killed 79, wounded 433, missing six. Total 3rd Canadian Division, 
554. 4th Canadian Division, officers killed 7, wounded 88, missing 1. Other ranks killed 196, wounded 1,191, missing 19. Total 4th Canadian Division, 1,502. Canadian Corps troops, officers killed 5, wounded 13, missing none. Other ranks killed 9, wounded 162, missing 2. Total for Canadian Corps troops, 191. Total for all four Canadian divisions plus Canadian Corps troops, officers killed 32, wounded 183, missing 5. Other ranks killed 540, wounded 3,456, missing 203. Total for all four Canadian divisions plus Canadian Corps troops, 4,419. August 8th to August 26th, total 11,706. August 26th to September 5th, total 8,999. September 5 to September 27, total 7,175. September 27 to October 12, total 15,106. October 12 to November 15, total 4,419. Total between August 8 to November 15, 4,419. Grand total, 46,405. One last scene. It is the morning of December 4, 1918. Corps headquarters, after leaving Mons, is established successively at Gosselies, near Charleroi, famous for its glass factories, now stripped bare, and at Huy, between Namur and Liège, a medieval town of rare beauty, grouped around the towering citadel that here frowns down upon the wide and tranquil Meuse. Thence we move, an arduous march up into the wild fastness of the Ardennes, to the village of ville -Sam. It lies in a little valley, and through it runs a brawling stream, on every hand shouldering hills girt with pine woods. Here are many slate mines, and from these, out of this all but inaccessible country, the methodical Bosch has taken the machinery. It is a desolate vista of mountain and heath, home of the stag and wild boar. Here, too, faggot cutters ply their hard calling, and peasants scratch a livelihood from the reluctant soil. Scattered about in this famous hunting country are the shooting lodges of wealthy European sportsmen, and in one of these, where now the corps commander has his headquarters, the crown prince lay hid during those fateful days preceding the armistice, and thence escaped into Holland. A few miles east, the hamlet of Poteau, a half-dozen scattered cottages, marks the international boundary it is raining mist swaths the rolling hills the corps commander stands at the crossroad to take the salute of our men marching into germany by his side is sir archibald macdonald g o c first canadian division and the canadian light horse supplies the escort fifty yards east is a german custom house where congregate curiously half fearfully German women and children, and with them the much uniformed customs officer. It is an impressive sight here at noon in the rain at Poteau, impressive to the imagination even more than to the eye. As they march past, these troops of the 1st Canadian Division, the 2nd Canadian Division crosses the boundary further south, led by the 3rd Battalion, Central Ontario and the 4th and 2nd Batteries, CFA, Canadian Field Artillery. It is the outward and visible sign of victory emerged at last from the dark years. 
the first canadian division is to cross the rhine at cologne the second canadian division at bonn it was first proposed that the entire canadian corps proceed to the rhine but difficulties of transport and supply led to a material reduction in the numbers of british divisions allocated to the occupation of the rhine bridgeheads but even with its representation thus cut in half the canadian corps is liberally treated sympathy at this hour is with the gallant third and fourth canadian divisions thus denied a legitimate ambition but these though they remain behind in belgium participate nevertheless in spirit in this triumphal march their desert is not less they have proved their valor and tenacity on many a bloody field they share in the honor common to all and are content in the knowledge that it redounds to the high repute of canada a fine driving rain beats down the country road is ankle deep in mud the head of the column comes in sight the men in full marching order their oilskin sheets over their shoulders eyes left eyes left runs down the line through the mist the figure of the corps commander looms erect a little stern as is his wont the familiar figure that on many a battlefield has proved a strength and inspiration to his men now as here in this place he returns a salute it is surely with the sense of a great task well done the band of the third battalion strikes up the maple leaf and the threadbare melody achieves dignity in this wind-swept space this frontier land between war and peace becomes poignant and noble we ride a little way into germany and then turn back to vilsam the rain has stopped and the sun is sinking into the west into a bed of heather and purple mist at the same moment he is beginning to cast his pale and horizontal rays over the distant canadian scene where children rub sleepy eyes in greeting of a new day end of part four chapter nine end of canada's hundred days by john livesay recording by james o'connor randolph massachusetts october 2010.